Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the ninth uh, meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone, as I usually do at this point in time, uh, to switch off their mobile phones uh, as they can sometimes interfere with the <coughs> sound system. You will also note, those you, who have been with us for the first time, that um, we have got members and officials using tablet devices, and this is instead of the hard copies of our papers. Um, uh, I'm, I should uh, start with an apology. I'm sorry to delay this morning. We had a private session on one of the committee's reports, and that's delayed us a wee bit, but I'm pleased that we're here this morning for this round table. Um, and as, as usual, although I look around and see some familiar faces and uh, old friends nearly, um, uh, I would invite um, everyone to, as we usually do at a round table, to introduce themselves for the record. My name is Duncan McNeill, um, MSP for Greenland and Clyde and convener of the committee. My name is Kenrick Lloyd-Jones and I'm from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in Scotland and I'm representing the Allied Health Professions Federation. Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the committee. Sandra Melville, I'm a pharmacist working in hospitals and a member of the Scottish Pharmacy Board of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Mike McKenzie, MSP for Highlands and Islands Region. Good morning, Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Harry Stevenson, President of Social Scotland. Good morning, Colin Keir, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Good morning, Frank Dunn, President of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. Good morning, Richard Lyle, MSP for the Central Region. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP, Mid Scotland and Fife. I'm Helen Richards, I'm Policy Officer at the RCN Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Peter Benny, I'm the chairman of BMA Scotland. My clinical job, I'm a consultant psychiatrist in Paisley. And Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Thanks to you all. Um, at this page, you know, in the rush of it all, usually a committee member to ask a question, so um, just to get us, uh, get us going. Uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow urges Scottish and UK governments to remove the inequity of care at weekends and public holidays. Does everyone agree that there's a lack of parity or inequity of care at weekend and public holidays? Yes. Everyone agrees? Peter? Well, yes, but... Um, the, there, I think, will always be a degree of inequity between working hours Monday to Friday, weekends and overnight. And in particular, when it comes to elective services, it seems to me that there should be, unless and until we have a hugely increased resource, both in terms of money and in terms of all staff, not just doctors. So we would very much see the focus here being about ensuring that we have got good quality, urgent and emergency care right across the seven days of the week, whatever time of day or night it is. But we would not be, at this point, pitching to try to make an exactly equal service at three in the morning on a Sunday compared to during the week. So, yes, but. Yes, but. <coughs> I'm done. Yeah, I, would, I would agree largely with that. I mean, our thrust from the Royal College was inequity of care for patients who are admitted urgently or as an emergency situation. So we cannot have a situation where if you're admitted as an emergency on a Monday to Friday, you've got more likely to have a chance of survival than on a Saturday, Sunday or on a public holiday. And the particularly vulnerable times are on the, the holiday weekends where there's a Monday as well. So there's a huge build-up Saturday, Sunday, Monday uh, of uh, a lack of resource that's, 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 there, that's there on a Monday to Friday. So... Our main thrust, and I agree that the, the elective situation has to be looked at differently. I don't think our resource would allow a seven-day working for everything, but we must initially make sure that patients who are admitted uh, for unscheduled care are treated and get the same standard of care throughout the working week and at weekends. So, yes, please, Helen. <coughs> I think similar as well that we believe that if a patient has clinically urgent health care needs, then they should be able to get high quality care when and where they need it, irrespective of the time or day of the week. So it's less about routine elective uh, services being available whenever, but more about the urgent health care needs. And when looking at 
what services should be made seven days a week. It's got to be evidence-based, so there has to be proper analysis about what is best for patient outcomes as well as best use of resources. And sort of following on from what you said, you're talking about services within hospitals, but it's not just when patients are admitted to hospitals, you have to look across the whole system. So hospitals, community, social care, and then look at the whole multidisciplinary workforce behind that. Uh, yes, please, Annie Stevenson. Social care in Scotland, what you find is there are seven day services 24 hours a day, but there wouldn't be the level of consistency you might want to find that can match what's required for people. Because some of these are essential services in terms of personal care and they're making sure they're at the right times to provide that. But the challenge will be stepping forward together in relation to this agenda of seven day working and the workforce <coughs> itself and modernising the service to be available uh, still requires, I think, some work in relation to relationships with trade unions, for example, to make sure we're going to gear up in that way for the public. Yeah. Please, Sandy. Um, no. Um, I think it's maybe worth just taking a moment to think that the, the cohort of patients that come in at weekends isn't the same as the ones that we have Monday to Friday and especially when we're looking at where we should, tar should target the finite resources that we have and where extra resources are required and the patients that tend to come in at the weekends tend to be more sick patients that haven't gone through the natural GP referral system, emergency admissions. They tend to be frailer patients with comorbidities, with more complex medicines. And certainly from the pharmacy point of view, that's where we feel that we can have a, a very valuable role in sorting out these um, problems right at the start of the patient's admission out of hours. And we, don't, we do that currently Monday to Friday, but not at the weekends. And I think that is a definite gap in patient care. And yes, I mean, just to follow on, absolutely, I think the, the rationale there is this is about unscheduled care and it is about making sure that services are um, designed around the patient and in the best interest of patients and where the evidence is to support that. And uh, clearly there is more that can be done. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I need to open with that question. I'm just trying to press you on that one, one again. I was just starving because there, there has been some debate, at least, in the political sense that the situation is different from here as elsewhere and, you know, whether it's a priority or not. But I think we all agree with the but, but we all agree that there's an additional risk if you find yourself in that emergency situation, public holidays, weekends, or indeed out of hours. Is, is there an additional risk there? We all agreed about that. No. Peter? The research on that tends to show that you are more likely to die or suffer complications if you're admitted at the weekend compared to admitted Monday to Friday. But there are confounding variables with that, in particular um, what you've heard already about the cohort of patients who are admitted at weekends are different from those who are admitted during the week and are generally more ill to start with. So. It's straightforward to agree that we must ensure that we've got good quality care around the clock. But there are some uncertainties about the exact meaning of the research. Because those who come in at the weekend are more unwell, it may be that the reason they have a worse outcome is because they were worse to start with, at least partially, rather than because we... we don't have the, the right services. In the way that the people who present well, at hospitals now uh, are w more unhealthy, uh, well, are, are of, uh, you know, in general, and as a general, you know, it's one of the problems that our health service has, in general, whether it be the weekend, during the week, the people who arrive at hospitals are more ill than they used to be. They've been kept in the community longer, and when they get to the hospital, they are of, they're vulnerable, they're older, uh, comorbidity, morbidity, all, all of that, 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 that's a general hospital demand, well, if not I may, just at weekends. If I may, as far as we can understand from the research, it is the case that that's more so at weekends. Now, maybe the, the way to look at this is to be as sure as we can be about the evidence base. If, if you look at, at page two of the, the interim report from the task force, it outlines the four areas that the the task force is working on, and they are define what we mean by seven-day services, 
map the current service levels across those clinical areas, then define the requirements for seven-day services, and then identify the steps needed to ensure that that happens. And it, it, we're very clear that's the right way to go about things. Our perspective at present is that part one of those has been delivered by the task force, that part two is at best only partially delivered. We don't yet have a real meaningful baseline of what's being provided at present, and we certainly don't have clear definition of the requirements because we don't fully have the baseline yet. So the task force is doing good work, but it's some distance away from being able to be getting down to the important part, which is number four. And I, I worry there's a danger that you might try to push us to tell you what the answer to four is before we know for sure what two is. We'll, we'll get to the wider discussion of all the problems, but we, you know, I'm just looking at the, the written submissions, there's loads of challenges in there about how difficult it is. That's not unusual when we talk about changing the health service. The committee is used to that, you, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, those sort of submissions. I'm just, I, when I look at it, I know it's going to be very difficult. If it's not clear, as you have said, that there's a lack of parity, uh, uh, parity at weekends and holidays, if it's not clear that people are more at risk, why are we doing it? Well, I, th I think there is there's some uh, the degree of debate about whether the patients are more ill at the weekend, but there's been numerous studies, not just in the UK, but in other parts of the world, indicating this uh, in, uh, vulnerability of patients at the weekend. And I think it may be partly because they present at a different time, but I think there are other factors. Uh, when you just look at the, the hospital at the weekend and you look at the support services within the hospital at the weekend, you look at the... The, the, the way the community services are stretched as well. I think there is a whole raft of problems. I think this is one trigger for it, but uh, those of us who have worked for many years appreciate that, well, that over the years you've been working with much more of a skeleton staff at the weekends, and that has impact on a number of different areas. I'd also venture that it's not just about patient safety it's also about things like delayed discharge and the fact that there's an enormous pressure on the system which could be relieved if systems were more fully operational at weekends um, and that is very much why it's related to a, a much wider question around um, prevention and supported discharge anyone else Richard it, it seems to me that I'm taking from the discussion that we already had that just to ask the, the witnesses about data. I mean, I, have we, are we actually collecting the data? We did an FOI on the, on the workforces at weekends, uh, which we published and we were told was rubbish. I mean, that was the information given to us by the health boards. We don't publish anything except what is given to us by the health boards. Um, do we have the data on, on, on the workforce during the weekend as opposed to during the week? Do we have the data with regard to the access to what the Royal College of Physicians of Glasgow have, I think, very helpfully listed as the tests that are required absolutely at the weekend? Are they actually available in every hospital that is carrying out admissions? Um, and just to, d to define it even further, if we take just two, two further elements, is there evidence... Uh, they're saying that we're, say, we're hearing that the weekend admissions are different to the week, weekday admissions. But is there evidence that, they, that the, some of the weekend admissions are not really requiring to be in hospital? Because the overall figure of that, I'm told, is could be as much as 30% of people being admitted to hospital currently who don't absolutely need to be in hospital, could be managed elsewhere. So do we know is that higher at the weekend or is it only complex cases? Um, and then the last thing is, uh, does does the data on anything specific show us anything? For example, uh, stroke, where we're supposed to have admission to an, a proper stroke unit within 24 hours isn't occurring in the percentage that we would like it to occur. Are the treatments for thrombolysis or the tests that would indicate that thrombolysis was appropriate, are they being done at the weekend or are they being delayed? You know, do we have actually a hard database on this, because that seems to me to be the starting point for determining whether we're going to make what is perhaps going to be quite a significant change in either the distribution of the workforce initially or in the long term, the total workforce in order to cope with weekend working. Anyone want to respond? 
Helen? Just on the data about the workforce. So the task force, as part of their initial work, did some baseline mapping of services and the workforce available during the week um, and out of hours and at weekends, which was an initial step, but certainly from nursing data, it wasn't enough to give meaningful data in order to do something with it. So the way the data was collected, it was very broad yeah. on the nursing numbers and what what you need to know from a nursing perspective as well as not just the number of nurses, but the level, who they are, that, who they are and what level they're working at. Yeah. So at the moment, with the data that's held nationally and from the data that was collected through the task force, we don't have that data set ready in a robust way that we could do meaningful analysis with. So I think there is more that can be done. Thank. I think the, the situation of patients with heart attacks in Scotland gives us an example of what can be done. Uh, now patients in the west of Scotland, there's the, the ambulance service are signed up, the technicians in the Golden Jubilee are signed up, the consultants work a 24-hour shift system and stay in the hospital at night. The support staff do the same, so that every patient who has a heart attack and needs to have a primary balloon procedure will have it within the specified time, irrespective of the time of the day or the day of the week that this happens. And that's because there's been a huge resource put into that. And if you take that back to other situations where all of these aspects, support staff, availability of transport, etc., are just not available in the same way for other situations. For example, discharging patients at the weekend, it's far more difficult to get transport home for them. It's far more difficult to, to get a care package started in patients who are discharged over the weekend than it is during the week. And this is just because people are, are, are stretched already and there's just not the resource to do it. So there is an issue at the weekend. Again, we've talked to the pharmacies and they can speak to that as well. But there certainly is the kind of infrastructure they see in these high-tech areas, such as heart attacks and stroke patients, are not being seen across the board in the vast majority. And, of course, it's the frail elderly that need to have this uh, uh, as much as anyone. Yes, please. On the um, I think, Frank, you've raised some very good points. S some of these things could possibly be addressed by discharge planning in advance and, and setting up care packages in, advan in advance. Um, from the pharmacy point of view, a lot of the, the preparing the, the, the discharge prescriptions for patients can often be done in advance. What we're really saying is we would like to see pharmacy at the front door when patients come in to try and solve the problems. And although we're, we're talking about, you know, it, does the database show that there is actually worse outcomes for patients at the weekends? And, and why is that the case? The data does quite clearly show there are worse outcomes for patients. There's a lot that we could do from the pharmacy perspective, not, not just in helping with the discharge planning, but in sorting the, the, the issues out, the medication issues out at the patients as they come in and throughout that patient's journey as, they are, as, a, as a, a, patient, a sick patient comes in and then deteriorates the medications that they're on then become less appropriate. And I think we have a very big role in preventing avoidable harm for patients as well as facilitating and helping to facilitate the discharge of these patients by making sure the medicines that they are on are correct for them right the way through their journey so that it's much easier to discharge them when they go home. And that can be done with, with pharmacy technical staff as well, but overseen by a pharmacist. So there's a lot there, I think, that we could do at, at both ends of the, of the, right through the patient's journey to facilitate the whole thing. So, um, first of all, Sandra makes a, a very good case there, um, but Second of all, it, it seems to me reading through the, the interim report of the task force that the, the data is a bit piecemeal. We know a lot about some services in certain areas. What we don't know is the, what's the availability of similar services elsewhere in the country. And in order to make the right decisions about this, we've got to have a broad baseline because any decisions are ultimately going to be about prioritisation. Um, we're simply not going to be able to provide all of the services that everyone around this table would want to provide unless there's very substantial changes in the resourcing. And of course anything that we provide at weekends within the current resourcing means that you're going to be reducing the input of those same staff during the week. So that's, I, I realise I'm banging on about it a bit, but that's why I was hoping that the task force 
certainly fairly soon, we'll have a much broader, much more effective database of what's being done just now. Because until we know what's being done just now, we're not going to be able to map across and, and take Frank's example in Glasgow and say for certain that that does or doesn't happen in Aberdeen or elsewhere in the country and decide, should it happen in all parts of the country? And if it should, then where does the resource come for that? And what do we decide not to resource in order to achieve it? It's that's that's the core of this and there is good work in this this interim report from the task force but i would expect the the next report to be much more broad based and telling us exactly what we've got just now and making some recommendations about what are the priority areas for improvement yes please Holly. you'll see from the evidence so short scotland that uh, where areas have tried uh, more uh, to have more service availability at weekends, there's just less discharge activity as part of the issue. So then it becomes an overhead where the staff aren't actually used, the availability is there. Now, again, the point I made earlier is not consistent though across the country. That is one of the challenges, I think, for all of us. But again, I'll make the same point that unless we move this all forward in step with good anticipated care plans, there will still be an issue, but the systems join up well together, I think. But there are certainly challenges mm -hmm. there, but I think there's mm -hmm. a willingness, and I think we identify where the issues may be. But we, we would need to be discharging seven days a week. But there seems to be a disconnect. I mean, your, your, your evidence in paper, you know, mentions that there are, you know, social work teams and they're there over the weekend. There might be, uh, you know, an issue about the, the public about when people are discharged. You know, you see stories about people being discharged at eight o'clock at night and people not happy or services, but there, see, you, 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 there were some areas where you went to the extent where, the, where you were sending letters into wards and hospitals reminding people that social services were available. You know, I mean, if that is not, you know, you know, I commend you for doing that, but I mean, is that the extent of the, uh, of the disconnect where the local hospital doesn't know what the local ser services uh, what local services may be available on a Friday afternoon, for instance, which is just as important as uh, you know, the Saturday and Monday or the public holiday. Well, what I would say, maybe if it's OK to continue, is I don't think um, that's a criticism of, of the fact folk are trying to make it happen, but it does oh. raise questions perhaps about how well it was planned. But clearly in our evidence we're saying there is an issue about communication in a very busy district general hospital and how, pe how people on wards know what's actually available and that view can be about outdated compared to what happens now and I think the reshaping care for other people money gave partnerships lots of opportunities to try new things to be innovative be creative I think some of that's actually worked very very well but we still have this challenge I think about communication if you don't mind maybe go back to this issue about discharges if we plan admissions well there's a better chance the discharge is planned early and it shouldn't be delayed any longer than is necessary. There have been workforce issues in some areas. There are issues about resources at times in different areas. So there's no doubt these have been factors that have been worked on. But if we get that admission correct, and one of the issues I pick up, even in my own area, and others may be able to comment on this, is also about um, out of hours, key decision makers, who are they? Do they feel confident? Is there risk averse practice perhaps because they don't know about resources? Perhaps there are locums, not a criticism, an observation of some of the infrastructure issues that may affect <coughs> our ability to make sure that journey is a smooth one for patients. Thanks, honey. I'd, I'd take them up a side track. Richard, do you, you follow up with your question? Yes. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Benny has made two very important points that, you know, we're having a sort of almost theoretical discussion about changing the system to a 24 7 across the board even service but you know it'll take years to create the staffing level for that unless there's a redistribution from the staff during the week and that seems fundamental to me so you know if if we need to know is there evidence for example that if i have a heart attack in the west of scotland i'm going to be treated in the golden jubilee with by this 24 7 service this you know, gold standard service that gives me the best chance of survival, whereas in Aberdeen and Edinburgh, I'm not. I mean, if we, if that is the situation, that's a serious issue we've got to address. But it may be the answer is actually not to open up Aberdeen and Edinburgh at the weekend, but to fly people to the Golden Jubilee. So, you know, there are, you know, is the Golden Jubilee's 24-7 service fully utilised? So th there are different approaches to this and how we work it. But the other thing is we should remember, in realistic terms, we have the highest number of consultant vacancies that we've ever seen. 
and we've got a very significant and growing, quite rapidly, number of nurse vacancies with a reduction in nursing student intake every year over seven years. So, you know, that, that, that was done on, a, on a, a work planning basis that may well have been appropriate. I don't know. But, you know, the fact remains that you will not create staff to have a 24-7 service, even covering the seven or eight areas listed in the interim report. So, I mean, my question is a really difficult one, which is if we're going to actually move, do we need to move towards this? If we do need to move towards this, does this mean that we really need to revisit as a parliament on a collective cross-party basis the whole issue of targets? Because the system is target-driven from a management point of view at the moment, and as long as we have to reach these targets Monday to Friday, we are not, in my view, going to be able to, to, to extend this in the short term without a, a major change. I'm starting to get confused whether you were given evidence or ask, uh, asking a question there, Richard. Well, the question is... Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, got, I mean, I think, the, you know, I think... Uh, I, got I think the question, uh, you know, the, the, the hard question is that, do we need to do this? Which we, I was trying to get out of this, uh, the opening of the... You know, the, is there a priority? Is there a drive to do this? Is there a, does a risk uh, exist? Where is the cost-benefit analysis? What are the outcomes going to be and whatever, and how do we achieve that? But, uh, and and uh, distortion of targets, I think, was the other question. So I mean, I'll go down in that, and I think Sandra was wanting in, in earlier as well, so I'll take you, you if you want to wrap up, and then I'll take the others. OK. But, uh, um, two so. points, if I can, just very quickly to, an to answer some of the things that, that Harry had said um, about discharge about discharge planning and getting it right from the start. And it's maybe useful to, to consider some of the models of practice that are exist in existence just now. And in the hospital where I work up in Oban, we have the social worker every day at what we call a board round. The board round, as opposed to a ward round okay. is where we all stand in, in the room together, everybody in the multidisciplinary team, and we just make a very quick summary of where each, each patient is in regards to their discharge, when is their discharge to be planned. We do this Monday to Friday, but it does also include planning for the weekend and social work are there so that everybody is aware of the, of the, the challenges that we need to overcome to make sure that that... And I think that's... It, you mentioned the C word, communication. Um, and it's crucial to, to NHS as it is in so many things. So I think that's something that, that could be rolled out wider that would really help this kind of thing. The more tricky um, areas that Richard ha had brought up were very interesting. Um, I don't think we do need an even service um, seven days a week because we're not going to do all the elective stuff that we do Monday to Friday. But we do need to have a, a service that is as safe for patients uh, at the weekends as is possible. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think that we, that we have that. And it's not just whether I think it or not, but there is evidence to, to suggest that the outcomes for patients at weekends aren't as good as they could be, they're worse than they could be, and I think there is, there is something that we could do. Targeting where the, where the resources are most, would be most usefully used, because they are finite resources, so it's, you know, where do we actually need to put in the extra resource to, to make outcomes better for patients? The very, very tricky question, and uh, I admire you for bringing it up, about should we be target-driven? I don't know that it's for me to answer that. But I think maybe being patient-driven would be a better way to look at things. Peter. Um, first of all, you were uh, smilingly congratulating the, uh, the evidence from Richard Simpson. Uh, I would agree with the evidence that he gave you. In terms of his questions, should we be doing this um, and should we be looking at the current targets? Well... This needs to be about the quality of care that is provided to patients. And there's no getting away from it. The current targets are much more about arbitrary measures, like four hours weight in A&E, which, as everyone around this table will know, is driven as much by some of the things we've been talking about already. The ability to discharge patients who are who're ready to go is one of the, the major areas that, that causes that. And also waiting list targets for elective surgery. It's easy to measure that, and we've got into a situation where, perhaps inadvertently, we seem to be prioritising elective surgery over urgent and emergency care. And for me, that is not your top priority when you're, when you're looking at the quality of care that you provide for people. And yes, I would like that revisited. 
can <coughs> recover the quality of, of data, but I think there are some fundamentals to the system as well. And certainly, um, speaking on behalf of the allied health professions, I mean, the allied health professions are not employed on a 52-week basis. Um, so there is no, unlike other clinical staff in the system, there's no backfill, for example, for annual leave or for sickness absence, etc. Um, so that fundamentally needs to be addressed if we're going to look to the, and the, the second more um, central issue to this is that if you simply look at spreading services more thinly, you may actually be providing a worse service because unless things are coordinated, then you will end up with, um, uh, for example, allied health professions in at weekends, but unable to refer on to social services um, if they, or, or to community setting care. And we know, for example, again, quality of data, we know that um, the Scottish Government have pointed out that there are um, virtually no community setting AHPs, with some notable exceptions. There's virtually no community AHP provision uh, at weekends. So th there are some fundamental aspects to address, as, as well as just looking at the quality of data and what we might prefer. Helen? I think some of the issues that Dr Simpson was raising relate to the sustainability of the NHS as a whole. Um, and I think over time there'll have to be difficult decisions <coughs> made about where we prioritise resources, where we can make changes which will have the best outcomes for patients. But we need to be careful because there's so many different areas of work happening now at a national level. There's so many different task forces. We've got the seven-day services task force. We've got the unscheduled care work. We've got the out-of-hours review. We've got delayed discharge groups. So we're really coordinating it all together so that we can look and have long-term discussions about the sustainability of the NHS as a whole. I think as well, there's no getting away with it if we are to move towards seven-day services that it will cost. We need to have proper evidence base and analysis of where any changes to services have the best outcomes for patients and make best use of resources. And when you were saying, do you think we should do it, move to seven-day services, I think it is about parity of outcomes for patients. So if the evidence does show that you do not get the same safe, effective, person-centered care, at weekends or overnights, then yes, we do need to change the way we do it. But it needs to be part of wider discussions and it needs to be about sustainable services. Frank? Just, just to, to reassure Richard, I did focus on heart attacks in the west of Scotland, but this is a gold-plated service that really is throughout the country and there are five centres. Uh, and I think really wherever you are, you know, given the, 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 the fact that travel can be a bit difficult at times, but apart from that, that is an example of putting resource into service. Scotland Wind has worked. In the situation of unscheduled care, you know, I totally agree with the situation that we need workforce issues here because I know examples of physiotherapists who come in on a Sunday, they do extra work and they take the Monday, they have to take the Monday off because of that, because of their, 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 their work. So there is this danger, as you mentioned, of spreading the, the workforce, and so workforce issues are very important. And the final point is outcomes that you mentioned, Helen. You know, what is the best outcome for a patient? Well, it may be a peaceful death in their own home with all the support they need. So because we can't necessarily measure outcomes in the same way as we can measure four-hour waiting lists, that doesn't make them any less important, but it's how we often do measure them and make sure that the patient is cared for in the right place in the right way with, with, with the confidence of their family as well. Thanks for that. We'll get um, Bob, can you take Thanks, us on, Kimina. please? Uh, really interesting discussion. I actually want to um, uh, refer to our witness, Richard Simpson's comments earlier. Um, <laughs> really interesting about um, consultant vacancies and uh, nursing student intake. Um, and Peter Benham was talking about baseline. So uh, there's a current baseline of 1,200 more consultants than there was before, and 2,300 more nurses and midwives than there, there was before. But I want to kind of widen it out. So that's the context by which Dr Simpson was, was talking about, but it's about having the right workforce with the right skills in the right place at the right time. <coughs> and I don't want to get focused on consultants and nurses, because the whole point around this table is it's also about physiotherapists, and it's about social workers, and it's about OTs, and it's about a whole, it's about pharmacy, a whole, a whole gambit of people. So I'm just interested to know about wider workforce planning because yes we can we can have 
more nurses, but if actually the need is to have a pharmacist doing a pharmaceutical care review at admission uh, and to make sure that there's no delayed discharge because medication is not there at the right time, then pharmacists might be the, the best spend investment. And it's trying to make sure how we get to see where the correct pressure points are. It goes back to the, the baseline argument. So some general comments on that would be quite good about, I know it's a complicated system, but we also mentioned priorities. Where would the priorities be? But also a, a kind of slight follow-up to that, convener, about is there buy-in from all the various stakeholders we have here? For example, by that, what I mean, if I was a physiotherapist, and just like you sit beside me, Kendrick, and I had my, my, my physiotherapy clinics Monday to Friday at times where I knew, and uh, the Integrated Health and Social Care says, actually, we want to restructure that. You're in a Saturday and Sunday now, Kendrick, and uh, that it's a seven-day contract you have, not a Monday to Friday contract. Is there buy-in? or is there financial consequences to that? Likewise for uh, pharmacists and other professionals. So is there buy-in to do this because it has to be done? Are there financial consequences just to restructure contracts irrespective of whether we increase headcount? And where, where are the various stakeholders on that? But back to my original question, where would you prioritise? Any takers? Sandra, and then uh, I see Harry indicating there. Thank you. I think Bob's made some, some very good points. If I could just add one point to that, I think what we should what we shouldn't lose sight of, and it's a, it was a common theme from a lot of the submissions, is working together, and it's about the different skills that each of these professions can bring to the patient. <laughs> But, but as part of, of the multidisciplinary team. And certainly on the consultant-led ward rounds that I go on every day, every day Monday to Friday, um, they, the, the feedback I get from them is that they miss that service at, at the weekend. But it's, be, it's working there as part of a team and bringing the pharmacy skill set to the benefit of the patient. And the same is the case with the, the physiotherapists and all the other team players. So I think it's maybe worth sort of considering it in that context. Harry? Yeah, I was going to make the point that um, there already is an infrastructure, of course, in Scotland in relation to both health and social care, and certainly social care services are required to be there, whether it's alert services for planned and unplanned <laughs> events in people's lives because of vulnerability. And, you know, some of your description, I mean, here at Mars Hospital, which I deal with most of my, my job, we have a hub which involves OT, physio, nurses, social work staff, looking at the discharge <coughs> arrangements, home <coughs> care, you know, being a key part of that. One of the things for me, though, is we should not be assessing people in hospital beds. We need to get them home safely and then look at how their lives have been affected by the need for a hospital admission. Uh, but certainly, I think the workforce's area evidence shows, uh, convener, that in some areas we're trying to move forward with residential type conditions of service. But it does cost more, but it's 24 hours a day then. And we need to, again, take this forward across the country to make that effective. But I do believe the health and care partnerships have a real opportunity in their commissioning plans to begin to reshape services for the future and to make them available when they're actually required. Okay, Peter, and then Helen. Um, Bob was asking about buy-in. Um, doctors are well used to providing a 24-7 service. We, we have done for certainly as long as my career and well, well before that. Um, and provided that there's a clear need for medical input, then that medical input will be there. Yes, there are resource implications, primarily about moving people from Monday to Friday to the weekend, but the vast majority of doctors are working weekends already. Um, I think this, it's a good point about the integrated joint boards as well, and it would be very helpful for them to have a bit of a stronger evidence base than the, the task force has been able to provide at present, so that they can run comparisons and, and be aware of what should be the baseline requirements. And at present I, I worry that they'll be they'll be working in a bit of a data vacuum and therefore possibly run the, the same risk that we're doing a little bit of of kinda of going, well we could do this or we could do that. In order to make sensible decisions you've got to have that broad view of everything that is currently being done and make decisions then on what are your priorities. Helen, please you are making about workforce are really important and I think you need that long-term integrated workforce planning that will support these multidisciplinary teams that we have that are so important um, and I think integration will help 
do that, but it was clear when we looked at the joint strategic commissioning plans for older people's services that partnerships had done, whereas they recognised that integrated work planning was a priority, they were struggling to actually get the plans underway. So I think more support, more work is needed around that. And I think it's, it's also about trying to maximise the contribution of each profession in multidisciplinary working. So if you take, as an example, decision making. So in order for patients to get the care that they need and for them to flow efficiently through the health and care system, you need skilled clinicians who are able and empowered to make decisions about that, their care, whether that's <coughs> diagnosis, um, treatments, uh, referring to tests, submissions, discharge. And historically, clinical decision making has been seen as sort of the role of doctors, whereas it's now more accepted that nurses or allied health professions can also be doing those senior clinical decision making roles. And we've got many fa fantastic examples of nurses, such as ad advanced nurse practitioners, working in these roles, often as part of multi multidisciplinary teams. We've got lots of good intermediate care services, such as hospital at home service in Lanarkshire, which is a completely multidisciplinary team. Consultants, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, links with social care. And especially in the community setting, they're the ones who are preventing the patient going into hospital in the first place and supporting them to be cared at home. So we need to consider how these decision-making roles from other professions um, can support patient flow, can support seven-day care, um, support patients to get the best possible outcomes. But we need to think about what is needed long-term around the sustainable workforce planning so that we have that workforce that we need to make those de uh, decisions and deliver those services. Very, very briefly follow up on that and let other committee mem members in. The more I kind of heard the evidence, um, the more I'm thinking politicians, of which myself and Dr Simpson do this a lot, is we, we set targets and is it a a thousand more nurses, is a thousand more doctors, and we keep hearing about multidisciplinary teams. And I'm, I'm just wondering if the politicians have to be a bit more nuanced and rather having a headline commitment of one <coughs> clinical discipline or one allied health professional, we stop making these headline commitments to X amount of doctors, nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, and start saying, what does this multidisciplinary team need? in this community and resource that. Of course, it makes election manifestos a lot less exciting, but maybe a lot more meaningful uh, on the ground when we start to deliver joined up uh, health and social care. So I'm just wondering, is it helpful or unhelpful? I and mean, there's nothing party political in this because my party does it as much as the Labour Party does. Can it be a bit unhelpful sometimes to have these headline figures where we pick one discipline and go, that's the target? Does that sometimes miss the bigger picture of these multidisciplinary teams? I suppose it's comment on that, but certainly, as I said, if you look at the infrastructure that's there already, I mean, if, for example, we do this differently, we do it well uh, and focused on early intervention and prevention, uh, then there's a chance to have success through that, I think. If we uh, discharge someone from hospital admission, 50% uh, of those individuals will, will be known already to home care, for example. Uh, that's my local area again. If we get someone and support them through a reablement programme of six weeks with our home care staff, we'll reduce the home care by about 27% following that. So these are quite startling bits of information to have at a local level. And everybody will have different bits of information about the impact they have. And I think also focusing folks on through some issues identified through ISD now, I think will help us focus on those people who use, require um, and benefit from the most intense services, whether it's pharmacy or whether it's medicine or nursing or social care. And we will know those individuals. There aren't a huge number of people in Scotland. We could focus on how well we support them. 
And we now support many, many more people now to end their life in their own home, actually, a point made earlier on. And the skill required for that is huge for social care staff as well as other disciplines uh, within the health and social care sector. So I, I think we do need to recognise there are a lot of good things going on while there are these significant challenges. And I do think the vehicle is health and care integration. And I think the, the direction of travel there, the support to that, and the leadership, though, will be required to make these changes are very, very important for the next five years and ten years. Frank Dunn. Yeah, I'm delighted to hear what, what Bob was saying there because I think the general public and indeed the allied health professionals are bewildered by the information that comes out from different political parties in terms of point scoring. Uh, you know, 700 more consultants, but there's 7.5 vacancies percent vacancies. So what does that mean? So I, I agree that what's far more important to look at systems, and systems involves looking at the whole panoply of allied health professionals, and it would be far more valuable to the public and indeed to the, to the allied health groups to hear, we have now got a system in place that involves examples uh, that have been quoted from Lanarkshire, for example, but we now have a system in place that's going to allow elderly patients to get to their own homes at the weekend as well as during the week. So that's one. Co that's a contribution that we've now made. Now let's look at the next contribution. And although that may seem piecemeal, I believe that all of these small cogs are very important. And we've seen this in Lanarkshire and other places of examples of excellence that we need to build on. But that's what the public would really like to hear: is uh, is a combined operation that leads to a clear endpoint in terms of the the right location, for example, for an elderly relative. Okay, Bob. Go ahead, Henrik, go on. Just, just to, to respond to some of that, uh, certainly on, on the, the question of buying the allied health professions, professional bodies um, are absolutely supportive of the ambition that people should see um, an allied health profession when they need to. And, um, and that, that this is an ambition for, for all of them. But I think the, the question you raised really is about integrated planning and integrated planning. Even when you refer, you know, is it an AHP or is it a nurse? But even the term AHP, there isn't a single AHP. That, that, that covers a whole range of, of professions. And so the question you have to say is not how many AHPs, but how many speech and language therapists, how many occupational therapists, how many radiographers. And that's why the issue of leadership is, is so essential in all this. And that's why we think that the, the question of the decision-making process by which services are planned needs also to be inclusive and involve the strategic input of the allied health professions, of the nurses, of pharmacists, of, of, uh, of, of medics, to ensure that we are operating optimally. Because otherwise, yes, you absolutely have the danger that, that uh, you get um, a, a physiotherapist or OTs somewhere on a Saturday um, so that they're not there on a Monday, and that simply provides a worse service because on the Saturday, even though there is an allied health professional provision, there aren't the other interlinked services that you can refer on to. So it's a reduced service at the weekends, and yet those staff are not available during the week. Peter? Um, I'd, I'd back up the evidence given by the other witnesses, um, but just to add to that, Bob seems to be asking us what would we like politicians not to do. Well, um, <laughs> with... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is, there's, only, there's only one thing on my list, and it, reading through the, the report of the task force, they're not at the stage yet of starting to make recommendations, but they are reporting on the number of units that do acute surgery across Scotland, and more than hinting that there are probably too many in terms of providing good quality care. So what I would quite like politicians not to do is to campaign to keep a hospital open if the conclusion of this work is that the best way of providing good quality care is actually to be moving some of those resources into the community and to be reducing the number of acute units in order to ensure that the actual quality of care produced to patients and the outcomes for them has improved. And I probably don't need to go over the track record on that kind of issue other than to say care report. I've got, uh, just to uh, let members know, I've got uh, Rhoda, then Mike, then Nanette, and then Dennis, just to let them know. And Richard Lyle. 
um, and I've got half an hour to do that. So, uh, Rhoda? Um, setting aside, I think, the staffing issues which we, we've covered, if, I mean, there are surely advantages to moving to seven-day care in that um, all elective surgery is done Monday to Friday. Most people's lives would... Um, lend it to having elective surgery at the weekend because of child care and work uh, commitments. If you were having day case surgery, for example, much easier to go in on a Saturday, get that done, you're back at your desk or you've got family to help out with child care. Um, would that not then create, and obviously it does have staffing implications, but would that not allow then hospitals to be staffed cost effectively to deal with emergencies at the weekend? Frank? I mean, I think there is, a, there is a point here, on the one hand, that the reason that the hospitals are more resourced during the week is there is a lot of elective activity. And I think unscheduled care patients benefit from that. But it, 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 the view of many of the health professionals is that that's a step too far at the moment. Because, again, we've got the health professionals to think about as well. Are they going to want to come in? You know, are they going to have the resource to come in with all their family pressures and to come in every weekend for elective activity as well? So I think the, the, the very much the, 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 the drive here is to make sure that for unscheduled care patients we do the very best we can to have an even service throughout the seven days. The elective, many of us feel, should be something that comes at a later stage depending on resource and everything else. But I certainly think here, and indeed in conversations we've had south of the border as well, that to go to seven-day elective service would be a huge step and one that would, from my point of view, just be beyond us at the moment. But, uh, just come in, because I, I, I was trying to make the point that this would have staffing implications. Of course it would. Mm. But if you're looking into the future, would this not be something that would be desirable? given that you would have to increase staffing and training and the like to do it. You couldn't do it tomorrow. Well, I would love to see the unscheduled care even. And I think once we did that, then we might have a platform to look at the next step. But I think that's such a major challenge for us. And the, and the, and the whole issue of unscheduled care is dominating what we're doing at the moment. The elective activity, of course, is very important and it's important for patients' quality of life and everything else. But we have such a huge issue now with, with, the, with the frail elderly population that I think that's become... And it, it's, it's an issue that embraces primary care, the community and the hospital. We're all in this together. And that's why some aspects of training of young doctors are being changed to make sure that we, that we, we embrace their skills both in the community and <coughs> in the hospital environment. Uh, Me too. Peter's suggestion about care uh, and focusing on certain units like um, Clay Bank, as you suggested by Hart mm. and, uh, earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that profession working any more weekends than they're currently working because if they were based at a particular area of activity, they might only be working mm. 1 in 20, they all, uh, you know, 1 in 30 if, if, the, if, if there's a sufficient team to carry them doesn't necessarily equal those professionals uh, working more weekends than, than, than they do now or indeed in the past. Peter? I think the, the key thing to get across is that the, the NHS in Scotland is very, very stretched at present. We've, we've got to keep a focus on, on making sure that we've actually got a sustainable and working NHS going forward into the future. And at its at its heart, the urgent and emergency care is absolutely essential. It, it's what the health service is there for. Whereas elective care at weekends is primarily, I think, about convenience. And we've got to ensure that the health service is fully effective at doing what it has to do before we start trying to improve the other aspects of it. But if they were there, it wouldn't be the National Health Service's interest to have them underutilised at weekends. That you've got consultants there and you've got them in, you know, and they, 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 and surgeons there, are, you're waiting, I suppose, waiting around for somebody to come well, but, through the door. Um, but that, that's my point. I mean, I'm, 
not aware there's any major issues at present in terms of underutilization of NHS staff. Quite the opposite, certainly if you look at, at doctors. The vacancy rate, the amount of extra hours that people are working unpaid, it's we're not in a situation where we've got people twiddling their thumbs just now, and it's likely that we're not providing as good care as we should be in terms of urgent and emergency. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, has to be our focus just now, surely. Well, I mean, the former Cabinet Secretary, we've got a chance to speak to the, the new one you know, later. Since we're paying them anyway, we often uh, we often triple time to be on call. It should be far better use of their talent and resources to have them working. Uh, for example, discharging patients who are really discharged. I mean, you know, it seemed to be from the, 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 the previous Cabinet Secretary that there was not using them effectively in a sustainable way. And I can't provoke you to respond, please. I can't. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can probably see from this distance the various responses that I might make to that. Perhaps the, the first one is to point out that actually, at present, doctors who are in doing the urgent and emergency care consultants are not paid triple time to do that. They're paid time and one third and the Cabinet Secretary simply got that wrong. And it, it just isn't the case that people are twiddling their thumbs. The health service is extremely stretched already, and what we're talking about around here is trying to ensure that it provides the best possible care for those in an urgent and emergency situation. And it's been a very much a kind of baseline acceptance within the task group, with the, within the task force, that that's the focus. It, I think it's a distraction to start talking about elective surgery on Saturdays and Sundays when the risk is that we're not providing good enough care in the urgent and emergency setting. I think my point was that if we were doing elective surgery at the weekend, we would be providing better care in the emergency setting because we would have those professionals, we'd have the radiographers, we'd have the doctors, we'd have the nurses, we'd have the staff in to do that work who could then be diverted to deal with the emergency. It seems to me, certainly on the FOI that um, we did, I mean, the staffing at the weekend and staffing during the week is chalk and cheese. I mean, it, it seems almost incredible that they would be able to deal with an emergency, the numbers that are rostered on, whereas if you had people on, they could deal with the emergencies. Sandra, um, Henrik, anyone else? Right, that's thank, okay. thank you very much. I'll, I'll take um, just looking at using existing resources, th there was a, an article on the, the BBC News this morning, I don't know if anybody saw it, yeah. about um, NHS England um, utilising pharmacists um, in the community, and we're talking about whole systems approach. I'm sure nobody around this table is surprised to hear that we'll be ahead of that in Scotland already, and we already have that system in place and have had for many years, where community pharmacists work with, closely with um, GPs and provide the minor ailment service, which is something that Scottish Government put in place a, a while ago. It, and through the minor ailment service, pharmacists deal with a lot of patients that have minor ailments. They stop them travelling GPs, but they also at the weekends. And community pharmacies are open every Saturday, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are open on Sundays. That resource is there already. Um, they prevent ad admissions into a &E because patients will rock up to a &E because they can't get to their GP surgery. And it's far easier than phoning NHS 24. And what is that phone number again? Not quite sure. Just, just rock up at the a &E, um, surgery. Um, if that minor ailment service, there are currently 890,000 patients in Scotland registered with the minor ailment service, but these are only the ones that are eligible for it, which are the ones that had previously been eligible for free prescriptions. 80% of the population of Scotland aren't registered, and if we were to extend that service to everybody, I think there's a huge um, difference that we could make. in taking the pressure off, as Peter so rightly says, the NHS staff in hospitals are not sitting there twiddling their thumbs, quite the reverse. That could help alleviate some of the pressure um, th it through hospital doors out of ours. Well, I, I think um, the, the issue that everybody is, is possibly struggling with is, is the prospect that if you move from a five-day to a seven-day service, that's an extra two days on top of five days, which is a 40% increase. So you're either going to achieve that by a 40% increase in funding and or you're going to thin services out during the week. And I, I don't know if there is evidence that it would be better to to, to thin the services out completely evenly, but I think there's there's the fear that that wouldn't necessarily be the most efficient use to have everybody go home at three o'clock so they can be 
there on Saturdays as well kind of sort of uh, argument. And I think the other question is, if you were to increase resource, is it really best devoted to acute care for elective surgery at weekends when there is so many other ways in which that money could be spent to reduce pressure on A&E, &E, to introduce preventative measures to support discharge in the community. Surely that is where the, um, uh, the extra funding ought to be devoted rather than um, uh, stretching services more, more thinly to, to cope. <coughs> Uh, Harley, yes, please, go on. Just an observation here. It does seem to, again, be like you focus very much on acute hospitals, uh, yes. when in fact, if we were to get uh, more capacity, more services, more flexibility in community and health and social care, that would make the difference, I'm quite sure, to what happens in a hospital ward and how we're able to get people back out again. I think you're right that we focus on, and of course, the, the written evidence. Your written evidence is much more. It's much more broad. Mm -hmm. So we've got that written evidence, thankfully, anyway. But if we do look up, um, you know, I was with my local pharmacist on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so that's evident. Um, um, you know, dealing with other things, dealing with care workers at the yeah. weekend, uh, social work at the weekend. I've got phone numbers. Of, there, there is a degree there which is still lacking, but if you look at the acute sector, mm. it's not as apparent. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's apparent that weekends, all these in recent, the, the long weekend at Christmas, that, 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 that there doesn't seem to be in the acute mm. sector the degree of flexibility that is in some of the other sectors and primary sectors. You know that. that, that, that you know, so, so I think it's quite natural that we, you know, we sort of skew, skew a bit to that because there are quite obviously, uh, uh, you know, um, and apparent to us uh, uh, some of those flexibilities where we're, whether we are where we want to be there or not. But it would seem that in the acute sector that is not as, as evident. I see um, Peter's is grimacing at that. Go ahead, Peter. I, I think you're in danger of paraphrasing slightly beyond the reality. I mean, certainly the acute sector at present provides very little in terms of elective surgery, not nothing at all, but, but very little compared to during the week. But in terms of um, emergency and urgent work, every single hospital in Scotland is working flat out every weekend and every night, caring for patients coming in with severe illnesses. What we're looking at here is how do we improve that further? Not how do we start an emergency service at weekends? Because we've got a fully functioning emergency service at weekends. We're just looking at how can we improve that more. In comparison to what's already happening in other sectors. Some, no, no, you absolutely, you, you absolutely wouldn't not. Agree, you wouldn't agree, Peter, that there are some good examples out there uh, with social work, there are. Uh, with, with uh, uh, pharmacies and others that, 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 that your profession can learn from? Let me try and answer that because you're, you're trying to box me into a corner it seems to me no what no I'm, I'm not boxing what I'm saying, a corner at all I, you know to, 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 what, to recognize maybe you what know, I'm saying what's staring us in the face right what I'm saying is and you may have noticed me nodding when colleagues have been giving evidence about the need to continue beefing up our community services what I'm saying is there's a danger that you're you're, you're drifting into a mindset that says that the only area in which there are flexibilities and in which people are working outside of normal working hours for most other people is in the community. In actual fact, the developments in the community are relatively recent compared to the hospitals that have been providing acute, urgent care right through and are continuing to improve what they do. So I, I just, I'm a little wary of us concluding well, that the you, current you, service you, you, doesn't work. You're overly work. defensive, I think, Peter, but, but well. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to recognise that in the community and I, well, and that, there are some very good practices that the, that the acute sector could pro, pro, possibly learn from. That was, <coughs> that was my basic contention. But if you're saying that you've got nothing to learn and you're ahead of that, then... There's no way I'm saying that. Right. That's, that's an outrageous thing to say. That well, that I'm saying there's nothing to learn. I didn't say that. Well, do, you, do, do you accept that there's some good pra practice in these other sectors that you could learn from? I go much further than that. Good. I agree that there are excellent practices outside hospitals and in hospitals. I'm not in any way suggesting that there's nothing to learn from in the community. But we all need to make progress. Good. We'll make progress then. Helen? Just a quick point on that. I think 
when we start talking about acute and community, there's a risk that we're just separating them out, whereas we've got to think of the flow of patients from the community into hospital out again. I think it's we need to look at the system as a whole and look at how community services, acute services, impact on each other whenever we're having any of these uh, conversations. So it's just a, a plea. I think community is really important looking at some of the seven-day care agenda, and we've heard some examples of really good community services, but we need to look at the system as a whole and understand how different areas of the system will impact on each other. Mike McKenzie. Oh, sorry, Frank, but we'll let, we'll let you get back in. You might be able to pick up on some of that. Thank you, convener. Mike. I should uh, probably first draw to the committee's attention the fact that <clears throat> Sandra Melville is my sister-in-law. Um, the and, and it's and it's not because of the the affection with in which I hold Sandra or or indeed the professional respect that I accord her for her, 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 her professional abilities. But I was very struck by the um, the written submission from the Royal Pharmaceutical Society because it seemed to offer possibilities of low hanging fruit. I think Sandra's already outlined that how. Um, the minor ailment service could perhaps be increased. Um, it strikes me that um, there, are, there will be other opportunities, other low-hanging fruit that can be picked. Again, going back to that written submission, that Glasgow pilot suggested there is low-hanging fruit in terms of improving clinical outcomes. Um, I just wonder, though, you know, from, from the various other witnesses, where there may be low-hanging fruit that could be picked you know, before we have a full-blown review and so on. Um, and the second aspect to that is that in terms of preventative spend, if I were to go um, and speak to John Swinney and attempt to convince him that there are there is low-hanging fruit, there are preventative spend aspects to this, and that, Mr Swinney, you could say, spend £10 here and save 20 bearing in mind the context of the austerity era in which we live, um, how would you make the case to Mr Swinney for this uh, preventative spend and are you able to put some numbers on that? Can Rick Swinney put some numbers on that? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, take that, I'll take that point first then actually. When we're talking about preventative spend, um, um, the Child Society of Physiotherapy has just produced um, a, a false prevention economic model and false prevention is a clear way in which if... If you look at the cost of the impact of falls, not just because some of those are very serious falls and you end up with, with um, uh, hip replacement surgery, which is extremely expensive, but also then the cost of rehabilitation, also the cost of social care when a, an older person has had a fall, prevention is, is a bit of a no-brainer. And um, we've put figures on that for every health board area in Scotland. And I would recommend you... Um, oh, I'll see you later to give you some more details on that. But what that requires is that money is invested in preventative services. And when we were speaking more generally about, well, the, the acute versus community, I think it is absolutely the case that you need to think about this in terms of patient flow, and I'd absolutely go with what, what Helen said. And, and let's bear in mind that the government paper that went to the task force says the provision of seven-day services are almost non-existent in the community setting for AHPs, with some notable exceptions. And there are some fantastic notable exceptions but that's what they remain. And the potential, therefore, to improve this patient flow is tremendous, but it requires investment in the kinds of examples like um, the hospital at home services in North Lanarkshire, where you have multidisciplinary teams providing care outside of hospital, preventing the need for acute care, because ultimately acute care is very, very expensive, and anything we can do to reduce the demand on acute care and to prevent people and to get them out of acute care more swiftly is to the benefit of the entire NHS. So it isn't just acute versus community in that context. Sandra? Uh, just respond, uh, th thank you, Mike, for, for bringing up the, the report from the Pharmaceutical Society. And it's a very good point that you make about low-lying fruit because the, the pilot that was done in Glasgow, in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, clearly outlines, um, and it was only a, a month a month's pilot, when you put clinical pharmacy in at the weekends, um, to actually improve patient outcomes, and they, they, they have the, the statistics there um, of the, 
the drug therapy problems that were identified, doses that were omitted, those adjustments that were made because of the, the patient's deteriorating clinical conditions. Uh, um, these are very, very easy outcomes to achieve simply by putting that clinical pharmacy <laughs> service there. And that, that has been demonstrated not just in Glasgow, but in various pilots throughout the country. But the one recurring theme across that is that in order for that to be sustainable and equitable across the patch, as so many of my colleagues have said, it's not a case of stretching what we've got through the week too thin. It does need to be resourced. And I think John Swinney, Swinney would be very receptive to that. Anyone else? Helen, Peter. So just an example of low-hanging fruit. So I, I mentioned um, advanced nurse practitioners earlier. So looking at the types of nursing role where nurses have the clinical skills uh, and the decision-making capability where they, I mean, with advanced nurse practitioners, they're in a whole range of different settings at the moment in the community, in the acute. Um, sometimes they're attached with GPs. Sometimes they're working as specialist nurses in the community and mental health. Uh, but there's some fantastic examples of how advanced nurse practitioners can improve outcomes for patients and can keep people treated in the community so that they don't go into hospital. There's an example in um, NHS Tayside of specialist heart failure nurses who manage patients within the community. They follow the sign guidelines so patients don't have to go to their GPs. They can be uh, managed in the nurse-led service and they've got good savings because they've avoided admissions uh, to hospital. But with advanced nurse practitioners and nurse specialists, there is patchy across the country. So there does need to be more national coordination, longer term workforce planning to try and actually get a sustainable workforce of these roles that can help support wider multiple, multiple disciplinary teams. Peter. I'd support both of those examples. In fact, Sandra has spoken a, a few times in, in her evidence about the, the potential value of having pharmacists available on ward rounds at the weekend, and I think that's, that's a very good case, and I'd, I'd agree with that. Having said that, I am slightly wary of the, the low-hanging fruit question, because that, it, it often comes up, and it always feels to me there's a danger that that's quite short-term thinking. There are this is such a broad subject that we've got to get it right. And each of the, the low-hanging fruit that we've, we've heard so far would cost money and would be a, a decision that was made about resources, which would then mean that you, you would be restricting the overall resource that you've got available to you. It's this great difficulty of do we think short-term or do we think long-term? I mean, in answer to the question about where's the, the most value for money, actually... I would say it's most likely to be in primary prevention of ill health. So that's reducing smoking, reducing drinking, improving the diet of people in Scotland, and balancing up as much as possible the social inequities in Scotland. It's a widely known uh, statistic that the, the life expectancy is 15 or more years better in the leafy suburbs of Bears Den compared to just a few miles away in the east end of Glasgow. That's where spending money makes the biggest difference to these kind of scenarios. But it doesn't do it in the kind of timescales of low-hanging fruit. It actually makes a, a real commitment to improving the health overall of the people of Scotland and reducing the demand as things go on. Harry? I was going to some point. Um, came here in relation to the things you know already in relation to health inequalities, the impact of that on people's lives, the ageing population... Um, poor, poorer health in ageing as well and the challenges of all of that and it does seem to me if the intention behind the new integration boards is that they have a they have in scope elements on schedule care uh, you need, if you're going to transfer from as we know um, emergency and acute type services to those based on a preventative uh, approach to them you need to shift the resource bridging that 
is part of the challenge in this, and we know that will be part of the challenge. And this is the opportunity with the integration fund, I believe, and I'm optimistic about all this because <coughs> I think it can work, that that would be one of the mechanisms I think we should be looking to in order to begin to make that shift take place and look at that and how you blend in where there's new investment required over and above the things we currently do or need to do different to redesign. And all of that, I think, relies within the scope of the new integrated bodies. Okay, just yeah, quickly, uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I have to thank Kenrick for his um, answer because it, it seemed to me that, and I haven't read the report and I hope he'll share it with the committee, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that's an example of what, what I was uh, looking for. And perhaps I should have uh, articulated that a wee bit better. Um, uh, maybe low-hanging fruit was not the best uh, description to use, but it, but it seems to me there's a case for um, uh, some rather obvious things that we should perhaps do right now. Um, but what I was really looking for is perhaps getting beyond the anecdotal or the pilot studies um, in terms of the health economics attached to this discussion. Can any of the witnesses guide us to a health economist that's published work that considers the kind of uh, it matters that we've been discussing this morning, so that we're taking um, decisions based on something that's beyond just the anecdotal. Can we add on a question that we've asked it as a committee before? What would we stop doing? To allow us to do better things, maybe, if we can get... Maybe it's the wrong question to ask at this stage, or the Cabinet Secretary hovering about outside, coming in for the next session. But, uh, you know, throw it out there anyway with Mike's um, important question. Frank, did I see you? Yep. Make it a point earlier that I spoke to some members of the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow staff yesterday in, in, in advance of this, and it was quite interesting just to hear from one of the consultants in unscheduled care. This is acute medicine consultant. There are five consultant physicians on every Saturday and Sunday at the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow. By the time they have dealt with the acute patients, it's probably early afternoon, and by that time they then go to the downstream wards, so-called wards where there may be, be some patients in the wrong ward, or a surgical ward because they don't have uh, beds in the medical ward, and then other, other wards where the patients have got over the acute incident and are perhaps ready to go home. So while they're waiting, the junior medics don't feel in a position to make the decision about discharge. And if the consultant is too busy, by the time they make that decision, then it's, it's, it's late in the, in the day to try and get transport. They then find difficulties in getting transport. But even if they did get the transport, then they wouldn't be able to, to have the care package appropriate enough for that patient. So from, from the medical staff right through the whole system, there are areas where more support is needed. And for us, I don't think we can focus on any, any one aspect and say this is working well, but the rest isn't. I think... They're all working to their capacity, but every segment needs to be improved to help with that whole process. And, uh, uh, and, and although it may seem getting patients home doesn't affect their outcome, of course it does. The, the older the patient is, the, the sooner you can safely get them home, that is the best outcome for that patient. Any other responses to make about it? I'm going to have to go on the net. Very briefly, convener. Um, I think it's been a fa fascinating, very wide-ranging discussion this morning. Um, clearly, a, lo a lot of thought going into the, the great deal that needs, needs to be done. One health professional that really has only been mentioned in passing this morning is actually the GP. And, uh, I mean, we, given the importance of the integration of um, adult health and social care, and we made, I certainly made great play during the passing of that legislation, as did other people in the committee, of the importance of the GP in a leadership role uh, within um, particularly locality integration boards and how important it is. Now, I don't think we've deliberately, I hope we haven't deliberately sidelined the GPs, but I do think they have a, a really key role to play in this. Now, I, I married to a retired GP and of the era when you went in on a Saturday, Sunday, and this was certainly, you never dreamt of having surgery premises closed at the weekend, you know, not completely closed for the whole weekend. And I'd make myself very unpopular, I think, with a modern GP if I suggested that they should go back to maybe working on Saturday mornings and even uh, on, on Sundays uh, to see their own patients. I just wonder what comments are around the table because I, I think 
I accept absolutely that nurses have a huge role and other health professionals uh, have, have a huge role as well. But I do think the GP has an integral role with, within that, uh, you know, uh, even overarching. And I think part of that role could well be at weekends, as I say, at risk of making myself very unpopular with some Peter, of my younger you medical colleagues. Peter, how popular is going to be with that <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to thank the net for bringing GPs up. It's late in the day, in fact, just technically after, after the session was due to finish. But... Um, First of all, what, what she's saying about the importance of, of GPs um, having a leadership role in the integrated joint boards, that's very true. Um, we don't have any grave concerns about GPs not doing that. Uh, the places are there and we expect that they will be there, although general practice itself is very stretched and so there, there may be difficulties in getting to meetings, especially if they're um, called at short notice. Um, there's also a place on the, the IJBs for a... a secondary care doctor in a leadership role as well and that's crucial and I, I think as the BMA we've had little difficulty in persuading GPs of the, the need to be very on board with this agenda it's a bit more of a challenge for us to get colleagues in secondary care to be fully aware of the changes that are coming and how that will affect hospital practice as well as, as general practice. In terms of GPs working at the weekend well of course, like all other doctors, GPs are providing a medical service 24-7. They're not providing it as they used to to their own patients, and I would hope most people around the table understand the reason for that is simply that it was an untenable model. It's much more sensible to have services provided in a more centralised way at weekends and at, at nights, and there's a, a whole separate strand of work being done by Scottish Government with a report due later this year on out of our GP services. Sandra. But just very, very briefly, I think in, it might have been in the, the, task, the interim task report, task force report, there was a mention of a model of care in Fort yeah. William um, where the GPs are very much in, involved and one of the things that the task force mentioned was the, the challenges in remote and rural areas which we haven't had time to touch on this morning but that was a very good solution of, of having the GPs in, in the hospital and using the <coughs> skill set that they have in an integrated way in, in the acute setting so that's maybe something that could be explored as well. And just briefly Chair, you, you mentioned um, well what could we do or, or stop doing. I think one essential factor for the whole system is that we need to incentivise prevention better than we do at present because I think the funding models, uh, even over a two or three year period, you may well not get the money back from the investment that you put into a preventative care um, uh, scenario for five or ten years. Um, the fact that, that that money could come back, but it doesn't solve anybody's immediate problem. So I think incentivising that long-term care would be an excellent way of doing it. And the other one would be to fund some research around the economic viability of preventative care, because the, the evidence base and the economic evidence um, go hand in hand, but they can be very uh, expensive to secure. And so maybe some support to get that health economic modelling up and running, because at the moment it's, it's done very piecemeal. Yeah. And I think a lot more effort needs to be done to look at exactly how we should be spending money more effectively for better decision making and better care. Thank you. Dennis Robertson. I'll try to be extremely brief, uh, convener. Um, for me, uh, I mean, there's been a, a lot of good uh, evidence this morning, and it's a point that I think Helen made about the patient pathway. And we're just wondering sometimes if we're concentrating too much on the sort of sectoral aspect rather than the patient pathway. Um, and for me, I'm not sure enough is being done, and I probably welcome your opinion, on, on preventing the patient actually getting to the hospital in the first place. I mean, Harry was talking about the discharge uh, and the multidisciplinary approach. You know, my, my thought is if we can prevent the patient going to the hospital setting in the first place and provide that service in the community that they need, uh, surely we're better uh, doing that than maybe having a patient going into hospital. Who, per, perhaps, and I think Richard Simpson made the point, maybe 30% of those admissions shouldn't really be admitted in the first place. So are we doing enough? And if we're not, how do we actually um, a, address that problem? And I know the preventative aspect is a, is a good ar argument. But in terms of you know, getting people to uh, either go to community pharmacy or 
stop them going to the hospital, but ensuring that the uh, community care, and it could just be it's the appropriate care package that they're needing, you know, <coughs> at, at that time. And, and that comes back to the, obviously, social work provision. It does seem to me you're right. Um, it is a complex issue because, I know, among other things, in a community would be, you know, access to the GP, pharmacy, other types of services. Many people are known to all of us already, anyway, as, as you well know. And I think it's about the ambition we would have to make that a better journey. And maybe somewhat clumsily, I was trying to get focused on the community. I do think the prevention agenda is really important here. What happens in a hospital is key to you. You arrive there, but there are a number of reasons why you end up at the door of a hospital and then why you're admitted yeah. following a, 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 an attendance at an E&E. So it is very complex, and there are excellent examples of good work across Scotland. I think you've heard some of that today. Uh, the question is, how do we learn from that and do more of the things that actually work and make a difference to people's lives? Mm. Yeah. Just quickly, I think, as you're right, there are many good examples of that preventative uh, community-based work trying to avoid people going into hospital at the first place but what was also clear from the reshaping care for older people the audit scotland report on that program was not enough was being done for shifting resources into the community to actually support those services um, to run and i know that the scottish government's response to that report i think said it's not just the case of shifting those resources but there will need to be new resource going into the community to support those services. Peter. And in particular to echo what Harry was saying earlier about bridging finance, because it, it is, it's a difficult one. It's a kind of chicken and egg. Do you close the beds first or do you beef up the community service first? And certainly my experience when um, psychiatry yeah. hospitals were downsizing substantially was that there was generally speaking, certainly where I was in the west of Scotland, sufficient bridging finance to allow the community resources to be up and running and functioning before the bed closure process. And if you don't do that, this falls at the first hurdle. So do we need to increase the primary care resources across the board in the sort of multidisciplinary aspect, not yeah. just in terms of ensuring that GPs are available or the appropriate um, specialist uh, practice nurses or whatever, but we need to ensure that the uh, social care uh, packages and the staffing is available um, to resource that as well. Um, absolutely, there are, there are certain key areas where we know um, these are you know, blue light accident and emergency risks, such as respiratory <coughs> conditions, heart conditions, and we know that we can place services in the community that can support people and prevent the likelihood of people being admitted to accident and emergency particularly at weekends but you know throughout and uh, what that therefore requires is investment to, to for that prevention but unfortunately that requires a shift from acute to primary care and and therein lies uh, an issue which um, has long been in place Richard Lyle. Thank you, Nina. Firstly, can I say that I think the National Health Service in Scotland is excellent. I've always said that. Um, but I, I want to come in on to, and I'll touch on a point that there, Milne made that I may offend also. I believe that we've actually got to change our working practices. Um, with the greatest respect to Peter and Helen, and I read your... your um, uh, submissions, uh, BMA say GPs are also providing a seven-day service throughout out of our service run by health boards. Uh, Royal College of Nurses basically say nursing has played an increasing role in the delivery of out of hours care in the community. So you both are claiming credit. Can I tell you that I actually worked, before I, I came in, became an MSP, I worked for the out of hours service in Lanarkshire as a driver and saw there and then what was being done by doctors. A small band of doctors came out at night to work. I saw the same doctors every week doing, doing things. Not every doctor in Lanarkshire plays their part in providing an out of hours service. And in fact, NHS Lanarkshire, this, uh, out of hours service at this moment in time in Lanarkshire, can't fill, can't fill the shifts. So they're having to shut down centres left, right and centre. And I worked out at Wisher, here in Myers, 
Monklands and also Lockhart Hospital in Lanark. Right? So GP surgery shut at 6 o'clock at night on a Friday. Don't open to 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. You know, so there we go. Doctors, I go to my doctor once every seven years, if I can help it. But people go regular every week. Saturdays and Sundays, everyone else has changed their practices. I used to be a grocer. Shops now are open 24 hours. Go to all the different big stores, I'll not name them, and, and you, can, you can go and shop, whatever. So, with the greatest respect, I believe that we have to look at it in reverse. We have to see what we can do. Because a doctor's not open at the weekend, everybody goes to out of hours. Or they go to A&E. In fact, they, go to, they don't want to wait at A&E for a couple of hours, so they phone up out of hours so they can get an appointment. And you can get an appointment at any time during the night. And I, and, and I was there three, four o'clock during the night. So basically, and also with the greatest respect, doctors were getting between 80 and 100, when I was there, between 80 and 120 pounds an hour. An hour. So they, I think they're well paid. So I believe that we have to look at weekend working, working practices, work and see what we can do best, and, and also... Um, I don't need to wear glasses as much now because I get cataracts done at weekend. I get two cataract operations done uh, at weekends at two different hosp hospitals in the last couple of years. So I believe we have to look at, and would you not agree that the point that I'm making is that we have to look at it in reverse. Doctors to provide more services locally that will then take pressures off hospitals, A&Es, etc., I'm, I'm guessing you'd like me to respond to that one. Um, I, I think Richard is in many ways talking about the same things that we've been talking about during this session, about the need for looking carefully at what all professions within the health and social services are doing and could do at weekends and overnight. Now, there is an out-of-hours GP service. It's not the same as the out-of-hours GP service 15 years ago. That's because the out-of-hours GP service 15 years ago consisted, to a large extent, of every single practice trying to cover their own patients, which was never sustainable. Never sustainable, and arguably also was part of the reason why general practice was struggling to recruit enough doctors at all. So we've got a review of what's to happen with out of our GP services and I am not even going to begin to try to suggest that Richard's entirely wrong about this the out of our GP services are struggling and stretched across the country but we've got to think about this in terms of who's best placed to do what at the weekends and that's what I think the task force is about Anyone else? The, the point I'm making, you know, everyone else has changed their working practice. Do doctors have to do the same? Or will doctors do the same? Doctors, as I said earlier, have been working out of hours and weekends long, long before Tesco's and the various other shops came around that were open all of the time. Doctors are well used to providing the service that is required for urgent and emergency care, and we're still doing that. But yes, there's a real need to look at how the out-of-hours GP service is running just now, and that's happening. So let's wait and see what comes out of that, please. Yes, and Kendrick. Sorry. Frank. Just, yeah, a, Frank yeah, just a brief point, point to add. You know, I fully support looking at the whole out-of-hours service for, for general practitioners, and I think there is an issue which again we're recognising in the training of young doctors that the, 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 the whole general practice move has been more towards looking after chronically, uh, chronic illness rather than acute illness. And that's partly, a, 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 a GPs have, have, have selected that, some have selected it, some still enjoy the acute work. And there's no doubt that a GP who knows his patient during the day and when that patient becomes unwell, that is the best individual that can decide the best place for that patient. But there are resource implications, and I'm hoping that Lewis Rich's report will, will shed light on this and bring us to a situation where there's more interaction between primary and secondary care, that some GPs actually have spells 
the, within the hospital environment and some hospital doctors are trained to work both in hospital and in primary care. I think that will bridge very well that, that chasm between them. Nick? Um, just the, the first point, I think, is that uh, although GPs are always, always going to be very key to the system, the health system has moved on and there are other health professionals. We now have physiotherapists and podiatrists with prescribing rights, the prospect of other allied health professionals coming on so that they can, for example, prescribe antibiotics to somebody with a respiratory condition at the weekend or out of hours so that will prevent the chances of it becoming a chronic condition where they get blue lighted to hospital. And I, and I don't think we should stretch the analogy with supermarkets too strongly because ultimately um, supermarkets are trying to attract customers and hospitals are very much trying <laughs> to reduce demand. I think we can all agree that we, we I think it was an RCN that said, we're not looking for the, the Tesco model for our health service, but uh, we've had um, a good debate, discussion here this morning, wide ranging though it was, I'm sure, uh, that like, like I do, that um, the other committee members appreciate the time that you've taken to come along here this morning and engage with us, and indeed the written responses that we've had from uh, from the participants here this morning have been also greatly appreciated and I'm sure that we will go on to have this discussion because it can't be uh, divorced in any shape or form from the future uh, 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 development of the health service that we, we're all committed to here the, this morning. Thank you all very much. I really must end at that point and get the Cabinet Secretary in. <laughs>
uh, number two on seven day services um, and reconvene um, with an apology again for keeping you hanging around out, out, uh, outside the cabinet secretary. Apologise for that. Um, uh, so <coughs> we welcome, of course, uh, the Sean and Robinson, the cabinet secretary for health and well being and sports, Shirley Rogers, NHS Scotland Workforce Director. Uh, Ian Finlay, Senior Medical Officer, Health Workforce, uh, and and Aitken, Programme Director, Sustainability and and Seven Day Services, and Liz Porterfield, Head of Planning and Clinical Priorities, the Scottish Government. Um, do, do you want to make a short statement, Cabinet Secretary? If, if you do, please if I could, continue. Just, just yes. briefly. Um, yes. well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, this is a, a big area of work which has the potential to uh, make significant improvements in the care provided to patients across the whole week and, importantly, to ensure that our health services are sustainable for the future. Um, in setting up the, the Sustainability and Seven Day Services Task Force just over a year ago, we recognise that the NHS is already delivering a range of services across seven days. However, we accepted that we could and do more to ensure that those services are readily accessible, of high quality and are sustainable. As you'll see from the definition agreed by the task force, what they have been focusing on is removing inappropriate variation in the care provided overnight and at weekends. Uh, for those who are acutely ill and for those who are already in hospital and need support to progress through their pathway of care. Sustainability is also crucial. The work the task force are progressing is looking at how we can make our workforce and our services sustainable for the future. We do recognise the challenges uh, in remote and rural Scotland in this respect and the task force has already started looking at ways to support uh, these areas. They've also initiated some specific work around the sustainability of services in our six rural general hospitals and there has been some early success with that work. It's not a quick fix, it's complex and some of the changes uh, will take time uh, to uh, work through. However, that doesn't mean that we can't take action now towards our aims and I've been encouraged by the progress made by the task force to date and welcome the next steps which are set out in the interim report published uh, on the 6th of March. One key theme that emerges from the report is about people receiving the right care from the right clinical team at the right time. For the majority of conditions or illnesses that care, that care is best provided locally by community-based healthcare staff. That means that our next steps need to look at enhancing those local services by exploring new models of care, such as community hubs and the greater use of community hospitals. Where more complex specialist care is needed, the service model may be a regional or even national one, and the report sets out the example of major trauma services where we are putting in place a network of care, including world-leading major trauma centres to provide the best quality specialist care for those patients with such severe injuries. This is absolutely also consistent with our work on integration of health and social care and the emerging national clinical strategy, all aimed at improving services and clinical outcomes, um, which will benefit patients and make the best use of our resources. We also need to make the best use of the skills and capability of the entire healthcare workforce. That includes nurses, allied health professionals and our so-called backroom staff, such as those working in the labs including healthcare scientists. And one of the next steps identified in the report is a review of the role of district nursing. Our nurses working in the community are crucial in caring for adults and children to provide care at home, particularly those with long-term conditions. We also intend to look at what more can be done to enable advanced nurse practitioners to act as decision makers and to look at how we can make ward rounds at the weekends more effective. We no, there's already some great work going on across Scotland. We need to build that and we need to spread it across all areas. Uh, additionally, the task force are looking at new models of care. The demand for diagnostic services has increased significantly over recent years. And through the first tranche of the Performance Fund, we're supporting increased diagnostic services at weekends. Alongside that, the task force are specifically looking at new ways of reviewing and reporting diagnostic imaging and at the provision of interventional radiology. So with a wide range of work as, such as this, it's vital that we uh, link and build on the range of national work already underway. Against the backdrop of integration, uh, we've got uh, our engagement around the 2020 vision and beyond that. 
and we've recently announced a review of the out of hours primary care services and of course the national clinical strategy uh, which is uh, at a, an early stage uh, so Convener, I hope I've given you a flavour of, of some of the work that's already underway, but also the early priorities for the, the task force uh, in their work going forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We'll go directly to our first question, which is from Bob Doris. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning, just a uh, Cabinet Secretary. We're all, almost at, at midday, and I was interested in the comments you made about, about, about the effectiveness or the efficiency of ward drawings, particularly at weekends, it links in, I think, to evidence we had from Frank Dunn, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, of Glasgow, who was talking about, um, you know, ward rounds not necessarily being able to then facilitate when someone should be discharged because uh, uh, perhaps the, the pharmacist isn't available for, for given medicine, or perhaps the, uh, we, we heard from, uh, who, who was the gentleman here, Harry Stevenson from Social Work Scotland, but perhaps there's uh, there's no connectivity care packages been available to to deal with uh, delayed discharge and, and that kind of thing. Or we also heard uh, in, in relation to uh, perhaps more junior doctors holding off from making key decisions because they wanted to wait to the consultant come around and about capacity building with uh, the right the right medical professional at the right time making the right decision, but also the you know the allied professionals that need to be part of that team. So you mentioned in your opening statement about needing to to be more efficient and take forward ward rounds, particularly at weekends. Is there any more information you could give us on how, how to progress that? Yep. Um, I mean, this is this is a key priority because uh, I mean, if you look, take one uh, performance uh, measurement, and that is uh, a &E performance, you look at where the spikes are in terms of, of delays. They tend to be at the beginning of the week, Mondays and Tuesdays. Part of the reason for that is the delay in uh, beds becoming available because weekend discharging hasn't happened and therefore discharging begins to happen at the, the beginning of the week but um, that's where the system becomes uh, most under pressure so we absolutely uh, need to, to get that right. Part of that is about who can make the decision around discharge and there's a lot of work going on around uh, the, the, the training of, of uh, nurse-led discharges. Uh, pharmacist, pharmacist availability is a key, so there's work going on about how can we make sure that that is available so that people can uh, go home with um, uh, with all of the what they require, including um, uh, medication. Um, so that work is, is ongoing. Shirley, do you want to say a little bit about some of the, more of the detail about taking that forward? Yeah, I think there are a number of elements that contribute to high quality ward round. Some of that is about the appropriateness of the decision maker and availability of senior decision makers. And as you're right, there are a number of factors around care packages, pharmacies, junior docs. Um, one of the principles that we're trying to walk towards as part of this work is about encouraging people to work to the top of their licence. And that's really partly about the delayed discharge issue, which everybody is very familiar with. But it's also about the opportunity to intervene when a patient needs it, rather than having to wait a period of time before they see somebody who can help them. Um, the work that we've undertaken so far is, is still early days. We've been looking at a number of hospitals that are, and, and trying to make a qualitative assessment about those ward rounds. And not surprisingly, we're demonstrating through that early work that the quality of work, ward rounds make a, a real impact on delayed discharge decisions, but more importantly, actually make an impact on the quality of care that patients receive. Can I move forward? I mean, I know it's, it, it, these things take as long as they take, and I, I get that, especially when you're, you're, you're trying to kind of uh, develop working practices and capacity to build uh, with, with professionals. But when do you think, for example, some of that work would come to fruition in terms of this committee or indeed a successor health committee mm -hmm. looking at some of that work and, and, and seeing how, how, how it has developed, hopefully successfully, more importantly, how that's then rolled out across 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 the wider NHS. Can I take yeah. that one? The, the Cabinet Secretary, I think, in her opening comments made a point about how there are a number of pieces of work that are coming together. Um, the Ward Round initiative is already out there with boards now as one of the top six priorities for unscheduled care. The work that this group is doing is, co is contributing the qualitative assessment around that. So if I could typify unscheduled care at looking at the flow, time of, um, time of discharge, accessibility to pharmacy services and some of the things that you talked about. This work is also working with the clinicians to look at what they find helpful in terms of ward rounds, decision making, confidence building around that, 
deployment of senior decision makers. So it's already out there now as one of the six priorities of unscheduled care. We will continue to supply this qualitative data to support that. Um, certainly boards are expected to get on with those six essentials in pretty short order and we certainly over the next few weeks and months want all of that to be in place, not least before we get into next winter's uh, uh, territory. So, um, so, And there's a lot of work going on around that. I suppose underlying the question over time scale, convener, and I'll make this my last question to let, to let my colleagues in, is in my initial question I mentioned pharmacists has been mm -hmm. key in relation to that to that whole process. And uh, again, with, with Sally Melville from the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland here giving evidence this morning as well. And it's about how we roll out best practice and guess the, the independence of, of health boards under strategic guidance from the Scottish Government to get on with the day-to-day -day job of of running hospitals and ward rounds and everything else. But Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for example, this committee knows because we visited uh, a pharmaceutical initiative there where they have centralised some of the dispensing facilities of pharmacy in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. In doing so, I forget the numbers, but maybe they've released about nine or ten clinical pharmacists to be on the ground doing clinical pharmacy reviews with patients at the outset of their visit to hospital mm. and they're more likely to be available ahead of discharge as well. So it seemed in face value could be a, an example of good practice, whether it's best practice, I have nothing to compare it with. But the reason for putting that on the record would be, if that is best practice, how do we roll that out across all health boards and make sure we get, we, you know, we get, we get a high standard of service across the entire NHS? Yeah. Well, the Once for Scotland approach is exactly that. It's about if it works well, then that's what we should be doing. And uh, that is uh, very, very clearly communicated to boards. Now, there might be some issues around, you know, what, what works in a rural general hospital and a district general might be slightly different from a teaching hospital. But nevertheless, uh, if, if something has been proven to, to work, then uh, the Once for Scotland approach is that that's, that's what should be rolled out and uh, I think boards are, are far more receptive uh, to, to that now because it's efficient and it actually means in terms of discharge it has a huge impact and being able to do that so the logic is is pretty uh, compelling and uh, the evidence is compel compelling as well. Can I just I, I ask, um, now you can back and say that I would, that was my final question but I'm just wondering <laughs> in terms of, of that so who is it, who, who would go this seems like a, a really good model um, it may or may not be suitable for your health board area, but we'd like you to uh, consider it. And if you don't decide to adopt it, that's fine. But please give reasons for not adopting it. Okay. Who pushes forward some of that stuff? So, I'll, Charlie will say a bit more about that in a minute. But, you know, I guess part of the reason uh, I have an, uh, a regular meeting with chairs, and that's an opportunity for me to disseminate some of that, that those key messages around priorities. But we have a performance management uh, arrangement where uh, we have a lot of very experienced uh, people within Scottish Government who have daily contact with boards around many of these matters. And you know, essentially, uh, if something uh, is, is, is working well, uh, uh, we would really expect a board to get on and do it, unless there were really important reasons why they couldn't. Do you want to say a little bit? Yeah, uh, Cabinet Secretary has given the general context. If I, if I might say that there are certain things that need evidence and piloting mm -hmm. and that sensible, there are certain things that are no-brainers mm -hmm. and, and where we've got something that is so evidently sensible to do, one of the things that specifically underpins the um, task force around this is a board operational leads group. So they get that information directly from the task force and, and are empowered to go back to their boards and see whether or not that can be implemented at pace within there. So there are some things about this where you know evidence is lighter because these are innovative models that are being developed. But there are some things where it makes sense that we want to ease the flow of a patient through the hospital. And if it's a pharmacy, if it's as, as simple as when they get their pharmacy kit supplied, then board operational leads will take that back from the task force and see whether or not that can be implemented. <coughs> and we want to hear from them if they come back saying it can't for whatever reason. Some of those reasons might be legitimate. If they're not, then again, we'll pose the question about how that good practice can be de deployed across the service. Okay, thank you very much. Can you that? Um, I presume, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you know, the motivation of this policy is a reflection that there are variations in outcomes 
between someone who going you know the, you know receiving out of care at weekends and 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 out of hours. Um, and we've had some discussion earlier on about you know what's the evidence base of that. Mm. Uh, and I pick up on your points there that the, the evidence base and that might be variable in itself and that if you present at a general hospital somewhere or a rural area rather than the central bell or, you know, the classic example I think we heard this morning was um, the Jubilee, then you, you, you'll get best practice, but if, if it's somewhere else it may, may not. So what is, uh, you know, what, 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 what work and research has been done and around those uh, variations, and what 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 did that uh, that research tell you? Well, I suppose there's some there's some elements that are 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 very uh, very clear. So if you look at the um, the the six essential actions on unscheduled care, that was a piece of work that was undertaken uh, by those who are experts on unscheduled care around what are the six things that all. Um, has to, all uh, our in, not just our E departments, but our hospitals have to do to um, be to make sure that the most efficient and effective use of resources and people mean the better outcome for for patients. So that work was done, and those six actions are now expected to be um, uh, delivered. And that is about looking at you know the fact that. The, the evidence says if you don't discharge people at the weekend, you're going to have a clog in the system at the beginning of the week. And that is shown by the fact that you have um, beds uh, you know, uh, taken up by people who don't need to be there at the beginning of the week. And that means that uh, the A&E performance at the beginning of the week is affected because they can't move people through. So some of that was just very, very clear. There are other areas that are maybe less clear and part of what Shirley was saying, we might pilot some of that in terms of testing out. Uh, but some of it is is a lot clearer in terms of what we know is not working well and the evidence there and, and what has been tested the ward rounds was mentioned earlier on some of it isn't rocket science it's just things that we know will make a difference and should be happening everywhere some of the other areas are newer so it might be things that are new and innovative and we have to test those out uh, because the evidence base is maybe not as well developed as some of the things that we know are more evidence based I was thinking more of the quality of outcomes and mortality and other things that, that, that you may run a higher risk if if you find yourself in the in the sector, uh, you know, out, out of hours, weekends, public holidays, or, uh, okay. And I, I was I was wondering, you was, I presume that that's what sets your priority. That there is a variation here. We need to deal with that. We need to reduce the risk to that individual a risk, which still exists while we are having task force and whatever, whatever. So what, what, what did that type of research um, tell us in, in terms of hospitals in Scotland and the, the, in terms of the level of risk and, and, and quality outcomes that people were experiencing or not? OK, I mean, there's not a huge amount of evidence in Scotland itself around issues of mortality uh, variation. There's more from down south. Um, but I think... As I said out in my opening remarks, you know the, the the kind of crux of the the work here has been how do we make sure we deliver a safe and sustainable service, uh, the best possible service, the best possible outcomes for patients, no matter when they're in the system, and that is about making sure that uh, and that why the early focus was on those who are already receiving services within a, a seven day context so they're, they're you know whether they're admitted over the weekend or whether they come through a and e uh, in the evening that we have to make sure that uh, the the services for those people are safe and sustainable and of a good quality everywhere so that was a, an early focus of the task force i think though where there's uh, the, the task force has also began to look as well what uh, what are the opportunities to you know do more diagnostics at the weekend? So, I guess that's why the task force has looked at different elements. Part of it is about reassurance that you know that, that our services are are safe and sustainable for patients, no matter when they come into the the system. The other part of the work is what is the opportunity and capability of doing more 
uh, across those seven days that are uh, would be more ele elective procedures. Well, we presume that you know, the, the international evidence and the evidence down south is accepted that we, we, we you know, I'm, I'm just wondering why we haven't carried out that research to ensure that given the international research and the research down south that patients in Scotland were not at risk as a, as a result. Surely, surely we, would, we should have been establishing whether they're at risk, whether they're at higher risk, and doing something about that situation. Well, we have the statistical information and mortality rates and ratios, and what all I'm saying to you is they don't show a, a significant cause for concern, but nevertheless, you know, it's very prudent of, of, uh, of us to make sure that we and the task force was that's why it was an early priority to make sure that what we have is a, a safe and sustainable service so even though there was nothing alerting us to a particular problem uh, with uh, seven day, you know uh, weekend or, uh, or or evenings it was prudent for us to uh, to have that as an early uh, look from the task force do you want to add in or yeah, yeah it's probably best place to take that no, you're right. The, the reason we're doing this work is because there was evidence elsewhere mortality was much higher at the weekend, as you said. It was at least 10% higher. The initial look at Scottish data suggested that that probably wasn't the case, and Scotland's Cabinet Secretary has said. But nevertheless, we broadly accepted that there was a risk that that could be the case. We have a smaller system, and it may be statistically the data from elsewhere may be more apt. And so for that reason, we broadly accepted that that risk may well exist. And that's exactly why we've developed a bit of scientific rigour in terms of how we've undertaken this work. That is that we have uh, agreed to, look, to map the situation in Scotland at present and then look at what we need <coughs> and then bring forward to you proposals uh, thereafter for that very reason. Being up for a year. We've been mapping a range of the priority areas, as outlined in the report for the last year. And We've been mapping what the service looks like and, and what's happening. And that brings you to some of the actions and conclusions, or does it...? Well, it will do. We will draw... Conc the, the next step of that work is to identify what constitutes a safe, sustainable service at weekends and then look at the difference and see what we need to do. So that will be the next stage, because this is really an interim... Uh, part of the process. And it doesn't sit on its own. I mean, there's work around very early days around the new national clinical strategy, which will be an important component of of, of that in terms of safe and sustainable services going yeah. forward. We, we, we may come back on yeah. some of that if there's time, because there seems to be lots of task forces and groups and lots of discussions going on while the situation hasn't changed. The risk still exists. Well, okay. we have spent over a year. I mean, the risk that you broadly assumed was evident, and we, you know, we accepted would maybe there a year ago, is still there because there's not been any change in the system that would that would alleviate that risk or reduce that risk or hazard to patients. Well, I, I guess that's an interpretation. Sorry. I'm sorry. I think it's important to say that hospital standard mortality rates are, are one piece of evidence in a very complex picture. There are a number of factors that would impact on whether or not a patient dies in hospital. Um, some of those are about the patient's condition, some of those are about access to other facilities, some of those are about a whole range of other factors that come into play. The other thing I, I would say is that I don't think what we were looking for was a, was a digital solution. What we weren't trying to do with sustainability in seven-day services is say there's one thing there that we can do that will fix this. What we were looking to try and do was to look at a range of measures that would improve the quality of the patient's care and experience of the seven days. You were right, Mr Doris was right, when he talked about variation in practice at the beginning of some of the questions. There were some variations in practice and we've been... Um, very blunt with boards about how we're being asking them to remove some of those variations. So some of the things that have been uh, an overspill from this patient safety programme, for example, things like surgical checklists, those good practices. We haven't waited mm -hmm. to, to the production of a report to go out to boards and say, we found this, this seems to be beneficial, this seems to reduce risk. We need you to be doing this now. So I, I wouldn't want to create in the committee's mind an impression that 
we did something with now just thinking about it. There are an awful lot of actions already underway to try and both improve hospital standard mortality rate, but also to improve the quality of care, decision making, and overall yeah. patient outcome. I'm looking for the general context because I, I do think it's very important from a, polit a, a political point of view <coughs> that we were, we were proposing dramatic change, as, as at least been reported to us from people who will be affected by that change early this morning, and they've written the evidence, etc. It's important. The, 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 the why we're doing this is pretty important. You know, there was a confused message from the previous cabinet secretary, as I, I used his quote this morning, about <coughs> this was about using the services and the workforce more efficiently at weekends, etc., etc. So, you know, I think there's a different type of imperative that you can get a lot more people on board with if we're dealing with, uh, you know best use of services and, and the workforce, of course, but in, in making this, this, the, the, the health service safer for people when, when, they get into, when they get into hospital. That's a different type of challenge for those people. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's the context both, I'm looking it? for. I'm mm -hmm. not looking, you know, yeah. uh, you know I, I, I wish we did have clear uh, research that showed that, uh, you know, that uh, we were prepared to accept that because that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a priority here about the, uh, the outcomes. But Shirley's point about the patient safety programme is absolutely critical here because we have a world leading patient safety programme that has absolutely not waited for the reports, um, you know, or, uh, about pa patient safety issues. It absolutely has got on the front foot to look at the, the, the best and safest practice across a whole range of, of mechanisms, whether it's about how um, the front door of the hospital organises itself um, to make sure that, that communication is right to hospital uh, um, acquired infection, all of that. So we haven't waited for this report. What this report does, though, is to look at those two things you've identified. How do we ensure we continue to deliver safe and sustainable services for everybody, no matter when they come into the system, but also how can we make better use of uh, the, the, the workforce and the, the, um, the resources we have over a seven-day period? Dennis Robertson. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I understand why we, we can focus sometimes on the acute services, but uh, is part of the initiative to try and ensure that we're looking for person-centred, safe, effective, sustainable, to use your terms. Um, so we could be looking at how do we prevent the person going into the hospital in the first place. Um, so how do we use our community services much better? Um, whether it be a community hospital, whether it be our community pharmacies, how do we actually use those services much better to prevent the patient getting to the hospital in the first place? Uh, and especially with remote and rural, are we using things like, um, a, for instance, the technology, the digital technology that's available, so we can actually do, do quite a lot of the work remotely as well? Well, well you're... you're question is really key, I think, to, to how we go forward uh, with the, the health service generally in Scotland. The, uh, we focus a lot of our time and attention on one small bit of the, the picture here, when actually most people get their health care from the rest of the picture, which is primary and community uh, service. And I'm very clear that we need to start spending more time and attention to that part of the system. So the task force has has looked at, at that and is looking at that um, in the context of some of the challenges. So we have the uh, out of hours challenges and uh, Lewis Ritchie's work on that will be very much aligned to the, the work of the task force as well. But huge opportunities. Uh, yesterday I was in uh, Oban and Loch Gilphead where you have a uh, rural general hospital model, which I think can teach us quite a lot around how we might deliver services in a different way within an urban context. So you have GPs who are uh, very much working to the, the top of their licence with additional training and skill level. And in Loch Gilphead, they have had a tremendous response to their uh, advertising for vacancies because it's a very attractive proposition for GPs who want to do a, a variation of work in their in their during the week, and uh, 
you know, huge excitement from the, the GPs involved there about what more they might be able to do. Now, there are some lessons I think we can learn there from that model uh, to uh, uh, within an urban context, and we're working and looking at the, the, the task force recommendations around that and some of the other work that we're doing about how might we begin to look at how we can provide more uh, care and treatment within a community setting in hours and out of hours um, that can uh, prevent people where they don't need to going into the secondary and tertiary healthcare system. So this is a huge potential area here. Um, now, it's, there's obviously going to be challenges in moving from the system we have at the moment, but I think those um, opportunities could be very attractive to general practice where at the moment they are uh, struggling to, to re recruit in some areas, but also uh, young doctors are choosing not to go into general practice. And uh, I think they uh, want to have more variation in the work that they do. So I think we need to, I'm very keen to create those opportunities and the benefit from the patient in all of this is that they get more of their care closer to home. To ensure that the patient is getting the appropriate service by the appropriate resources within the community and that they have the confidence in, say, the person. You mentioned the GP cabinet secretary, <laughs> but quite often um, the patients uh, perhaps have maybe greater confidence maybe in their, uh, say, nurse practitioner, for instance, or, or, or even their, their, their community pharmacist. Um, are we doing enough to, to try and get the message across to the patient group that, you know, the, those people within the community are as essential to their particular care and well-being um, as, the, as, the, as they can actually get in hospital. Well, the GP is only part of the team. And yeah. if you look at the, the team in Loch Gilthead and Oban, again, advanced nurse practitioners, AHPs, uh, paramedics are all part of the team that delivers in hours and out of hours care. Uh, if you look in an urban co semi-urban context, uh, the Clackmannanshire uh, Health <coughs> Centre, uh, which brings together uh, GP practices uh, with uh, with uh, nurses, with AHPs, with dentists, it's a kind of one-door approach, um, working with social care very closely as well. So they've developed some very innovative working, which, for example, has identified the cohort of people within that area that tend to make the most use of unscheduled care and have managed to dramatically reduce admissions to hospital because they're keeping people safe in their own home. So there's a lot of uh, good examples. The challenge for us is how do we, how do we spread that? Um, because we have a system at the moment that doesn't look like that, re generally speaking, in urban Scotland. Uh, we have some good examples of where it works. The challenge is that the next stage of how do we, if we decide, if we agree, um, I think there's, if we need to make sure that, and I think there is a general consensus that that could be a better model. How do we, how do we begin to shift from where we are at the moment <coughs> to, towards that, that type of model? Convener, finally, um, Cabinet Secretary, you, you're asking the question, how do we? Can I ask the question, how do we? Well, we are looking <laughs> at the moment around testing out more of this, mo this model within an urban context. We know it works well in a rural uh, context. We have some examples of it working well in an urban context, particularly in, uh, in Clip Manager. Uh, what I'd like to do is to test it in more of an urban setting uh, and uh, with a, a, a coalition of, of, of the willing, of, uh, of folk who want to be part of that. I think we could demonstrate that actually this is a model that would uh, deliver a, a very uh, good level of patient care, uh, but also would be sustainable uh, going forward. So uh, we are on the case with that, and I'm very happy to come back to the committee to share more details as we, we take that forward. Thank you, Nanette Millen. Yes, I mean, I, I found this really very interesting, as our previous session was as well, because it's clearly a huge area that, that many things have to be considered, and, and clearly integration of health and social care comes into this as well, <coughs> I'd imagine, in, in rolling out the possibilities of, of, of seven-day care. Um, I presume we'll be getting an update on that on Thursday when there's a debate on health, so integration of health and social care. But just, it would be quite interesting to know how things are going along those lines and the sort of buy-in of the various people who will be involved in that. And that's my main question. The other one is in terms of, I 
we, we know there's a great willingness, particularly from pharmacists, to, to be more involved with seven-day care. Presumably this means renegotiation of contracts because they're currently on a five-day-a-week contract. Um, I, I presume that would be the case and uh, can be any information as to how easy or difficult that might be. Okay, uh, on integration, uh, this is a critical part of, of, of the, the way forward with new models. Um, it is critical that we have um, not just integration between health and social care, but we have better integration within the health system as well. And that we have, there's opportunities for, for that to be far, far uh, better. Uh, than uh, than it is at the moment, and again, that's a, a critical part of it. So, you know, the 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 high level um, agreement between our, ourselves and COSLA around integration has been important. But what's probably more important is the partnerships on the ground, getting on with the job in hand, and uh, the signals are are very positive. Uh, we are. Um, they, there have been good working relationships. You can imagine that they've been kind of first out the, the stall, getting on. Uh, but even in areas, areas that maybe traditionally not been uh, such great uh, uh, working across the, the systems, um, this has really focused people's minds because it's a well, legislative requirement, but also there's some additional resources behind it which have helped to oil the wheels and help people look at new service delivery models as well. Is what we don't want is kind of same old, same old. So just two systems coming together, but the same services. We need them to think differently about prevention of admission to hospital as much as making sure that there's timely discharge from hospital. So that those early uh, wins are important. We've asked the new integrated joint boards to focus very much on their equivalent of the the two percent of the the population that use about fifty percent of unscheduled. Uh, capacity at the moment. That's what they've done in Clitmanisher and what we'd like is the, uh, in the, the joint boards everywhere to focus on their 2% because you can imagine that would be quite an early win of, of helping uh, keep those people safe at home and avoid hospital ad admission, avoidable uh, hospital admission. In terms of um, contracts, in terms of conditions, I mean that's, we're not in that territory at the moment because obviously that's um, uh, there are processes and procedures for that and, and those will be respected and, and recognised. It is fair to say that Agenda for Change uh, actually recognises seven-day working um, uh, and, and that's good and that's positive. Uh, but you know, we would absolutely respect the normal processes and procedures for taking this forward with other groups. I hope, though, people see the opportunity here and I think for GPs particularly, there is an opportunity to do things a bit differently and to to really give the profession a, 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 an opportunity to develop and change what it does. But we need to do that hand in hand. And certainly, I, I hope um, that, that, there's a, that they seize this opportunity um, and take it forward. But obviously, we need to go through the proper processes of discussion with them around that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Annette. Uh, Rhoda Grant. <laughs> Um, from the first panel this morning, there seemed to be a degree of unity that there were um, dis disparities in service between evening and weekend and during during the day, um, and that that needed to be worked on. And I wonder, is this report and is this piece of work about evening out those disparities for emergency care, not for, for, for scheduled care, but for emergency care? Or is it about moving um, the NHS on to a 24-7 basis altogether? Well, the, I mean, the NHS is not Tesco. So the idea that, you know, you would have everything that's done at the moment done 24-7, I mean, there's good patient safety reasons to not be doing elective procedures at four o'clock in the morning, let alone, you know, uh, some of the... The, the, the complexities of when you would discharge people if you were doing that, even if you wanted to. So I think we have to be clear what we're talking about here. And that is that you know we, we first of all, and the task force is very clear about this, make sure that, our, uh, that we're already working across seven days, but making sure that that is safe and sustainable. Um, but then looking at the opportunities for additional diagnostics, for example, at the, the weekend there's already uh, work going on around that with using the performance fund to um, uh, have 
additional diagnostic opportunities at, uh, at the weekend. There's clinics happening at the weekend already, but there may be scope uh, for more of that. So I think we have to be very clear what we're, what we're, what we're talking about here is, is not trying to you know, do what we do in the NHS 24-7. I don't think that is realistic or desirable, um, given what I've said earlier about you know, the patient safety issues. Uh, but it is about making the system, um, ironing out some of the disparities, as you say, making sure that what we do across seven days is safe and sustainable, but looking at opportunities to do more. And I think diagnostics is a good example of that and the, the area of, of discharge at the weekend. Some of the things that would have big impacts on the system, making the system more efficient and effective. Um, and actually, they're not that difficult to do. It's about the way people work. It's about um, having the right people at the right place at the right time to be able to do all of that, including the pharmacy. Um, that's not rocket science. It is, though, about bringing that together and making sure that that flows over the weekend so that patients can flow out of the system uh, over the weekend as well. Be because you've got weekday working, <coughs> it seems that outcomes for patients during the week are better because you have a critical mass of staff who are in there and able to do the diagnostics. The whole range of, of, of things that somebody coming in needing unscheduled, unscheduled care would need. At the weekend, it seems to be that the same range of staff, especially diagnostics, radiographers, mm -hmm. pharmacists, the, that whole written labs, porters, the whole, the whole thing are not available. How do you then create that seven days to make sure that someone coming in requiring that service gets it um, and make that cost effective without looking at some elements of elective work as well? Oh, I'll ask Shirley to say a little bit of the detail on what Glasgow are doing around some of the uh, radiology and the, the um, making that far more effective and working over seven days so they can turn around um, results. Do you want to say a little bit? Yeah, I would, might, might I pick up a couple, of, mm -hmm. a couple of issues from the themes that we've been talking about? I mean, one of the questions asked by um, a colleague who asked about rurality pointed me to um, rural sustainability, which is a huge issue in respect of, of this work. And there are two things that I wanted to just give as illustrative examples of things that are already happening that are helping us towards sustainability. One is the community hospital that's developed for the Western Isles. That, that uses a range of um, clinicians and um, other NHS staff, advanced practice nurses, paramedics, GPs in the overnight hours, and a number of other um, colleagues who come together who provide that service. We know that GPs have exceptional patient assessment skills. As a result of that um, new method of working, bringing together that multidisciplinary team, admissions into the Western Isles Hospital have reduced by 17% as evaluated. So that, that means, that reassures me that patients are getting a good assessment because they're getting somebody, a clinician with good experience who sees them when they arrive at the hospital and they're getting pointed in the direction of the right kind of care. It also means that rather than discussing the sort of inelegant delayed discharge, which are people, we're talking about not having so many people going into hospital inappropriately in the first place. We, we talk a little bit about the uh, sustainability of, of remote and rural workforce. And the example that I would give, and these are a no, there are a number of these things already happening in Scotland, but the example that I would give is an initiative which we've undertaken with working with colleagues in Fort William. They had a couple of consultant posts that they'd had vacant for some time. Um, Unless you have particular lifestyle or clinical practice choices, those opportunities are not always those that generate a huge number of applicants. Working with colleagues in NHS Lothian, we were able to put together an educational um, experience and support package into Fort William, which meant that we went from having no applicants to seven suitable appointable applicants. Mm. You know, it, it is quite... You know, it is quite a thing in, in some of our vacancies to have that kind of number of applicants. And that was about making sure that people who were drawn to remote and rural practice didn't feel that in choosing that they were abandoned to nothing but remote and rural practice. And that, I think, is, is something which is really innovative and is, is starting now to bear shoots across the piece. Um, 
you, in your question as well, so you also mentioned the, the use of digital um, support, and, and there is no doubt that we're doing more around that. But we're also starting to see some real benefits in things like, for example, the development of Scottstar and our ability to retrieve patients and take them to the place that is best able to treat their needs. Scottstar um, effectiveness is, I think, going to be something that we will doubtless come back with further evidence in due course, but is already starting to show real clinical effectiveness in respect of that. So coming back to the point that, that you were making about variation in, in, in the week, there is no doubt that there is some variation around some of that, and there is no doubt that we will, as, as, as uh, another colleague mentioned earlier on, in due course come to a negotiation of, of terms and conditions around that. What we've been very clear about from the outset of this work that, is that it would be the service models, the patient requirements, that would determine the shape of those negotiations. And I, and I think that's really important. That's really important partly because that's what we're here for, and partly because all of the clinicians that I've ever met wanted to come to work in the NHS and do a good job. They want to be able to play the fullest possible part, and we want to be able to give them a service model that they can pin their professional coattails to. So some of the work that has been seen through the task force have been pro proposals from the RCN about the extended role that nursing and midwifery staff could, could undertake as part of this work. You've already heard, I think, quite persuasively from pharmacy colleagues who've got a huge role to play in respect of this, and a number of others who will come together, not least the ambulance service in terms of the paramedic cohort. And we've got examples of that work now happening all over remote and rural Scotland, from Bookie to Fort William to some initiatives in, in the island communities and to the model that the Cabinet Secretary described in Clackmannanshire which just for general information is a, is a facility now that has within it three GP surgeries, two inpatient beds, um, and 24 additional services that are available through advanced nurse practice and some work from social care partners in terms of psychiatry support and those kinds of things. So not just the tube that used to be a fence that you couldn't climb through. So it's really, really important. In Glasgow, the radiotherapy services have not really been redesigned so much as reorganised. It's been bringing together a group of disparate services that mean, quite frankly, that you've got a bigger rotor. So you've got the opportunity to run those services and make diagnostic, uh, diagnostic support available to people in a wider range of times than just Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And again, that comes back to, to your point, Mr McNeil, which is not just about the, the mortality stuff, but the sheer effectiveness and efficiency that goes together to make a better patient outcome. Can, can I just ask one, one final question? Um, part of the evidence we also received this morning was that people are sicker at the weekend, which kind of seemed to puzzle me slightly. Um, has any work been undertaken to see why people are sicker at the weekend? Surely weekends are good for you, not bad for you? I'm not so sure that I would say that the human heart necessarily knows whether it's going to have a heart attack on a Friday or a Sunday. I, I, I'm not so sure that I would necessarily say that people are sicker. What I would say is that on a number of occasions, some of the services that might help patients who experience difficulties at the weekend are more difficult to access. Any of you that have been involved in mental health care perhaps might be familiar with that. Um, there is some evidence, there was some evidence when we saw the spike in Lanarkshire's HSMR figures last year, there was some evidence posed about the avail availability of care home facilities at the weekend and access to care support, mm -hmm. and whether or not, to be frank, sadly patients were taken into hospital because they were going to die and there was nowhere else for them to be. So I'm, I'm not sure that I've seen evidence that suggests that people are actually sicker at the weekend, but I think the infrastructure, which is why I made the point about the complexity of HSMR, the infrastructure that is um, necessary um, and various other factors, I mean, there, there are factors that would suggest, for example, that we, with fr fragmented families, people go and visit their parents at the weekend and they notice that they're poorly and they've probably been poorly for a couple of days. So there are a number of factors that come together in, in that respect. Um, what we're trying to do through this work is make sure that the patient experience and the patient outcome is as good as we can make it and that we give the opportunity for the whole of the clinical team to be able to be involved in the decision making that, that, that essentially means that patients get a better outcome and reduce variation where we find it.
where that's possible. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Cabinet, uh, uh, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you said that uh, the NHS is not Tesco. I, I couldn't agree more, but Tesco a number of years ago wasn't open on a Saturday and Sunday and uh, are late. Um, and now most food... Sorry? That was a few years ago. Yeah, a few years ago. Well, I, I, I worked in the grocery trade away at the very start of my career and uh, never worked on a Sunday. But now you can get into most shops now, 10 o'clock at night. But that aside, doctor surgery is shut generally on a Friday, 6 o'clock. <coughs> Don't open up again until 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. Out of our service has to cope with it. Uh, we're coming up for Easter Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Easter uh, weekend, which, again, possibly uh, out of ours will need to cope with. So when do you think we'll ever get a seven-day service from our doctors uh, that we could get an appointment on a, at a local doctor's surgery or rather than attending a &E or out of hours on a Saturday or a Sunday. Do you ever think we'll get to that? Uh, yes, um, but it might be a multidisciplinary team. It's not just about doctors. It's also about advanced nurse practitioners. It's about the role of paramedics. It's about that skill set that can build a safe, sustainable out of hours provision that um, doesn't rely on one health professional for its sustainability. Now, you know, going back to 2004 when uh, GPs uh, were, um, when the responsibility for out of hours was removed from GPs and health boards took that on, what we've seen is a, a growth of various models uh, that health boards have developed to, to try and provide that out of hours service. The reason, uh, well, there's a number of reasons, but the primary reason that, uh, that I felt that it was important to uh, review uh, those set of circumstances is because we're you know, 11 years down the line, uh, boards are continuing to wrestle with how they provide a safe, sustainable out of hours service. And um, what I felt was important was to, to look at how do we take a more coherent approach to that. Now, that might not be that the exact same model that... Uh, that works in Glasgow will necessarily work in uh, in Mull or, or Tyree or, or whatever. But nevertheless, uh, Lewis Rich's review will look at the urban and the rural context, will look at who, who does what at the moment, but who could do what with the right skill uh, set and training and support. And in some ways, rural Scotland has, has got to grips with this a bit better. I'm not saying there's not fragility in some areas, there is, but actually the, some innovative solutions have been born out of necessity in parts of rural Scotland. So, for example, the extended use of, of paramedics, the use of advanced nurse practitioners, is something that's more well advanced in parts of rural Scotland uh, providing out of our services than is perhaps the case in urban Scotland. So, you know, Lewis Ritchie is getting ahead with uh, with uh, his his work. There's a lot of good people uh, around his review group, and uh, what we need it to do is to to feed into this agenda of the of seven day working, and and also, you know, to look at the. The, the out of hours issue um, isn't just about GP out of hours. It has to look at it has to look at in hour services as well. It has to look at the ambulance service. It has to look at A and E. It has to look at NHS twenty four. So of course uh, he will be you know speaking uh, and and uh, looking uh, and closely working with all of those organisations uh, to make sure that the recommendations that come forward. Uh, can help us to get onto a, a sustainable footing with out of our services because I want it to be something that can go through into the long term that is uh, not, you know, is going to have more robustness and resilience behind it. I'll try not. I know other people will want in, but just, just for my own sake, can you confirm or, or you know, agree with me that if people could go to the local GP on a Saturday and a Sunday that that would relieve pressures on A&E and out of our service? Well, again, it, it, it might not be just a GP. It might be a GP if that's what's required. If someone needs to see a doctor out of hours, then clearly um, it, it should be a, a doctor that they, they should see if that is the requirement. But quite often, uh, someone um, can be equally 
uh, seen and treated and satisfied with uh, a, an advanced nurse practitioner or a, padme, a paramedic. Um, I think it depends on, it's about getting the, the right health professional to the person and making sure that they get the, the right support that they need. Uh, that might be about bringing in social care uh, support to, to the person concerned. And if you look at uh, how the, the service in uh, Club Manager operates, you know, it's a multidisciplinary team that is a kind of rapid response team that that uh, is is formed around that cohort of people who are the regular users of out of our services, um, rather than the occasional user, because the same it, it, you know that two percent of people remember use fifty percent of unscheduled yeah. care capacity. That is huge. So there, there is a service developed specifically for them, which is rapid, it's responsive, it gets the right service to those folks. So we, we want to make sure, I don't want to be back looking at out of hours in a couple of years time. I want to get a model that is going to stand the test of time, that, that gives patients what they need, um, but uses the skills of the, the wider workforce rather than it just being about GPs, although GPs will always have an important part to play. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about GPs. Thank you, Gideon. Yes, um, just switching to the uh, hospital-based service, um, you've made a decision on major trauma units, which are very much welcome that that, that decision has been made, but it's really it's about the numbers of services that we've got. Your interim report refers, for example, that we're going to have four major trauma units I know that the College of Surgeons said two. I think politically that would have been impossible, but four, you know, is the evidence base there for expenditure? The same with the, <clears throat> with the mapping exercise that's shown that we've got 29 sites for acute general surgery, uh, acute urology, 21 sites, and I'm sure it varies for the other things like orthopedics and the rest. If we're going to have a service uh, that is effective, then... If you take a population like Greater Manchester, they would probably have maybe two or three services. Now, I know our geography is a problem, and I know also the politics are a problem, but really, you know, our, if we're going to have effective weekend working without having people are present for elective surgery, then, you know, having people there only for emergency surgery on 29 sites might not be very cost effective. So, how is the work stream addressing? this very difficult balance between what people want locally and what is actually effective, efficient, will save lives and is also sustainable in the long term. If the national clinical strategy will influence um, a, a lot of that thinking, and that's not about the national clinical strategy saying, therefore, in such and such a location, you should have it. it what, what it will lay out is looking at the evidence base around uh, what uh, what the best outcomes for for patients will be in various um, across various uh, specialities. So that work is a, an early stage, as you know, but uh, will be very important in determining some of these things. But there are um, other ways of delivering some of the the services. Part of the the difficulty at the moment is around recruitment and retention of some of the specialities, particularly within our district general hospitals. Now, obviously, patient safety comes first, and we may need to make sure that all of our services are safe. But the way that we recruit and deliver services, I think, needs to change. And the use of the network, for example, um, Shirley earlier on described how we were moving to um, sustain some of our services within our rural general hospitals by linking some of those um, uh, those doctors, um, particularly within specialities, to the teaching hospital and various uh, networks are being established around that. But actually, there's no reason, in my view, why some of that wouldn't work effectively within our district general hospitals, that actually you could have a far more attractive uh, um, re uh, process of recruitment to some of those specialities if they knew that they would be working part of their time within a teaching hospital environment while also providing support to the district generals. And I think there's the opportunity to do far more of that across Scotland. Um, so I, I guess um, 
we need to allow the, the national clinical strategy to get on the way to, put, to help us f formulate the thinking around some of that. Uh, but, but part of it is also about making decisions that can overcome some of the recruitment and retention challenges that we have within our system. And I think we need to be far smarter when recruiting to those posts that we develop, we recruit to a network rather than, you know, a particular position in a, a district general hospital. And, you know, the fact that we have vacancies still within some of those specialities that are incredibly challenging to fill, I think means we have to look at that in a, a very different way. Yeah, sorry. You're right. Scotland's a big place and Scotland's also a small place. And, you know, in recruitment terms, from the pool of population, it's a relatively small marketplace that we, that we operate in, and, and you'll be aware of that. It is also geographically a very spread place. So we do always have to play access and the accessibility of services, particularly emergency services in life-threatening circumstances, into, into that space. The game's changing a little bit. We talked earlier on about Scott Star and those kinds of services around retrieval and those kinds of things. Um, Cabinet Secretary has talked about recruitment. I think recruitment has got to have some regional <coughs> context to it and some national context to it. If we're talking about profusionists, for example, where we have a, a tiny workforce, it makes little sense to me to have boards competing for that workforce. Mm -hmm. It makes much more sense Absolutely. to do that on a national basis and try and increase the numbers overall. Mm -hmm. so, so there are recruitment propositions that will come forward as part of this work. Cabinet Secretary alluded to the point that I'd made earlier on about the relationships between hospitals. We're also doing quite a lot of work at the moment in expanding the approach around clinical fellows, for example, to give people exposure, to give people an opportunity to look at things and to work in a specialist context perhaps even looking at some specialist GP stuff. There are, there are now a number of um, universities who are starting to talk to us about whether or not there's a specialty about being a rural GP. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to make, to make a lot of sense. So you're right, it will always be a balance between the bigness that is Scotland and the smallness that is Scotland in terms of its population. Our role, I think, is to provide evidence about what is the best service for those patients. Yeah. What is reasonable for us to be able to do in terms of that staffing model? And, and you know, I, I sadly can't knit consultants any better than anybody else can. We've expanded that workforce considerably, but it is finite. So our job, I think, is to present Cabinet Secretary with evidence to options of ways that the service can be made more sustainable. It will be for others to decide what the acceptability of those options are, but that will be based on the evidence of what we've seen. So we know vascular surgery needs a population of seven to 800,000 people in order for it to be at its optimum efficiency. That will take you to an answer. Whether or not that's going to be an acceptable answer will be for others to decide, I think. I mean, if the outcomes are better, then it will be acceptable. We have to demonstrate exactly. that. I mean... I'm very aware that, you know, the model in Scotland that we've adopted, which is managed care networks, is one, although the King's Fund has said the jury's out on it, I'm convinced that actually it's going to deliver in the long term. But that is, at the moment, about the elective procedures, mm -hmm. and it works well. I mean, when I had my cancer, it was operated on in Glasgow by the Fourth Valley consultant going into Glasgow, and the team there of backup that he had meant that his skills were, were managed well. Two other health boards in the west of Scotland don't buy into that, which means the outcomes, you know, inevitably, I think, are going to be poorer. So, but that's elective. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, it, you know, it's going to be really difficult to get that into uh, uh, the non-elective, the, the unplanned emergency side. And I just wonder whether, how, whether that you've got any examples at all so far of taking uh, things of that sort um, mm -hmm. For example, the vascular surgery, which is the part of the most developed, uh, is that working well with the five centres? This might be best place to... Um, it's working well in two areas. It's not as advanced in one area, um, but it is actually developing, and it's developing on a regional model. And as for the network, one of the ones that was successful around the emergency side of things as opposed to the elective, I think is the network model in Fife and Tayside, which is part of that overall development, and also in the north, where they're coming together to do that. 
um, the west of Scotland is the area that I had to look at where would be the most the optimal place for provision, given the paradigm of the population model to have enough skills and maintain and sustain the expertise. Um, they're still looking at it, and again, that partly is about where health boards want, where the pathways naturally go for patients. But it's 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 being looked at. It is underway. And I expect to see more progress in the West, which is a bit further behind than the other two. And we do keep asking about progress. And that's in what particular field? Because we heard from the, Frank that's Dunn, in the vascular. West was very good on... The, yeah, that's in vascular. I mean, they, they do well, but there's more that could still be done. And right. uh, National Planning Forum keeps asking about how it's getting on. OK. That's very helpful, actually. Thank you. Just a, a, a plea for others. We've spoke lots about, see, so we're still there, and the, the, you know, but nurses and profession, you know, the, the clinical profession, all of that led. But you know, the, this whole question of slowing down those who get in the hospital and getting them out quicker <coughs> is a tremendous uh, burden uh, on community-delivered social services. Um, I suppose. The question I want to ask is it not time that we actually considered uh, health and social care service rather than just the health service? Because I seem, you know, in terms of, I mean, it raises, it raises the obvious, and it, you know, and, and I think we all appreciate here about that. Uh, you know, how how are they going to pick up this this additional work? Will it be will it be funded? Uh, but but the the other question, I suppose, is that that. Lots of this burden has been taken up with um, a lower skilled workforce who who are dealing are, are working in very stressful situations who also affect the outcome in patients that don't get to that hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, but don't want to be but the fifteen minute visit, the task based mm -hmm. approach. Dealing with a myriad of, of people now, motor neurons, alcoholism, <laughs> dementia, and all of the other things that, 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 is a, that, that, that is a big pressure on professionally trained people. You know, what, yeah. what, what in the workforce planning mm -hmm. are we doing to reshape that workforce, develop that workforce, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, give them the status maybe that the, 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 the due and all in this process. Yep. Well, integration, I think, is the, the, the best chance we have of bringing those two systems together. And that's the, you know, the, the, the course of travel we've decided upon is that, you know, through legislation, they would be brought together. Um, and I, I'm optimistic that that will remove some of the perverse incentives that we've seen um, within those systems of, of pushing and, and pull. However, you, you raise a, a very important point about where within that team um, does uh, the, the care staff sit. And, you know, there are issues around uh, their, uh, their paying conditions and training and career opportunities. So one of the things we've been talking to with COSLA is around how, how can we help uh, local government and the sector to raise some of the, the standards and quality there. And those discussions are, are ongoing about the, the best way of doing that. Uh, I think there are opportunities around career progression to remove some of the artificial boundaries between whether people can, with the, the right training and qualifications, perhaps move into uh, jobs within the NHS far more easily from um, standing off perhaps in the, 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 the care uh, sector or indeed the other way uh, around the, what, for example, uh, nurses do within nursing homes, for example. Um, there's the opportunity for those skills to be developed and uh, to be uh, far more developed than they are at the moment and to be more attractive as positions. Um, so it is a, a, a challenge. I think being part of a wider healthcare team will help. So the model in Clint Manager that we've talked about a lot today um, doesn't just uh, re rely on you know the, the care staff picking up the... The, the cases, it's it's also district nurses, it's also advanced nurse practitioners, it's also 
a range of other staff that are there to support someone with dementia or quite quite complex care needs uh, within their home and i think that's important because you're right you know that i think asking care staff alone to uh, to to manage very complex care needs at home um isn't a sustainable thing which is why they have to be part of this wider wider team and uh, and to, to be supported. So that's what we want to see happen. Um, and we, as I say, we're, we're discussing with local government about how we can play our part to make that um, the more um, more likely to be the outcome. Uh, and the, the opportunities, I think, to develop that workforce and support that workforce better uh, are, are there. And uh, as I say, we want to, to play our part in doing that, surely. A couple of quick things, if I may. Um, part of my responsibility is to um, lead something around health and social care workforce integration. So we have regular dialogue with um, partners from um, local authority, care home and other uh, um, suppliers about what, what are the things that we can bring together. And one of the things that we're in the early stages of now is looking at that workforce planning, making sure that we've got data that allows us to compare apples with apples and so on. Um, we've also um, just recently launched a career framework that does exactly what the Cabinet Secretary says in respect of um, giving an educational ladder, for want of a better word, to try and give people the opportunity to ex expand. There are two other groups that we haven't really talked about that much who've been fundamental into the task force work. One of them has been the representation around patients, who have actually been describing for us what they want to see. And really what you were describing was about what it feels like to be at the end of a service. Mm -hmm. so, so that's something which has been really important to shaping up that work. And the other, and, and I'm very happy to acknowledge the incredible contribution of our trade union partners, who've actually been prepared to look at some of these models, help develop some of these models. Now, that isn't to suggest that I think we're going to, you know, hold hands and walk off into a glorious sunset in negotiation terms. There may be some very difficult conversations around that. But actually, these models are, are supported by the trade union partners, and that's terribly important in terms of demonstrating the case for change. Yeah, that they've got that sort of voice, but the, the, I suppose the, the general point that was making that we've got a service in the National Health Service, mm -hmm. but when we look at care, where all, a lot of these people are going, you've got the private sector, the third sector, yeah. local government, You're different employers, right. whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. There isn't a system. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and uh, and I'm not suggesting that because we've got these inputs that all of that will be very easy. It, it won't. But there are a number of things that we can do together that starts to make that feel like a real cohesive service for a patient or a service yeah. user. But those people at the bottom are the people who are dealing with every day. They're not dealing with the social work manager or, 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 or the district nurse Indeed. team. Or, anyway. Yeah, I'll be very conscious of that. Right, okay. Uh, I don't think there's any other questions. We're very, we, we need to move on. Thank you all for that. We need to move on quickly to... The next item of our agenda, which we hope to dispose with very quickly, fairly quickly. Right, um, we go back on the record then um, and move to agenda item number three, which you'll be grateful to hear is our final uh, uh, item on the agenda, um, uh, where we consider subordinate legislation. We've one affirmative instrument before us today, 
Um, as usual, as a reminder, with aff affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence and taking session with the Cabinet Secretary uh, and her officials uh, who, who are with her now. Uh, once we have uh, had all of our questions uh, answered, then we will move to the formal debate as, as necessary. And the instrument before us today is the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014 Consequential Modifications and Saving Order 2015. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, is, is, is joined by Alison Taylor, Head of Strategy and Delivery, Integration, and Claire McKinley, Solicitor, Food, Children, Education, Health and Social Care, Scottish Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you wish to make a short opening statement? Very briefly, um, it, this order makes uh, minor amendments to primary and secondary legislation, all of which are in consequence of changes made by the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. It also makes a, a saving provision to allow the integration arrangements already operating in the Highland area to transition into arrangements under the new legislation without a gap and at a date that is locally determined. The order will firstly ensure that uh, integration joint boards, once established, have similar duties as health boards and local authorities, such as a requirement on them to give certain information to the provider of the patient advice service as a result of an amendment to include them as a, a relevant body under the Patients' Rights Scotland Act 2011. Secondly, ensure that certain other pieces of legislation will continue to work properly when functions are delegated under the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014. Thirdly, make the necessary changes following repeal of Section 5A of the Social Work Scotland Act 1968, which made provision for local authority plans for community care services. This updates the statute book to remove or replace out-of-date references. Uh, fourthly, includes uh, a savings provision so that the arrangements made under the Community Care and Health Scotland Act 2002, sections 15 to 17 Highland, may continue until replaced with integration arrangements under the 2014 Act. Fifthly, members will wish to note that this order does not take forward any new policy. However, I'd be happy to take any questions on any of the modifications it contains. So are there any questions for members? Brother. Just a very quick question. Does this suggest that the, um, the legislation we passed, the Public Bodies Bill, is not flexible enough to allow local arrangements to come into play where people can find a good way of working together? I know Highland's probably the only one that have kind of gone down the road they have with integration. Mm -hmm. But is, is the legislation flexible enough to allow local arrangements to come into play where that works? Well, yeah, I mean, it does. Alison, do you want to...? to Absolutely. The provision in terms of Highland is actually just there to make sure that they can continue to use the arrangements that they've already put in place until they move under the auspices of the new Act. So it, it doesn't have any bearing on flexibility for local decisions yeah. to suit local circumstances. No other questions from members? I'll therefore then move to agenda item number four. Uh, which is to uh, which is a formal debate uh, on the second of a, uh, on the second of the affirmative SSI which I've just taken. I don't know. That's my script. And definitely, whoever who did that script. Anyway, <laughs> we, we move on to the formal debate. Uh, and can I invite the cabinet secretary to move motion S four M one two six four five. Formally uh, moved. Thank you, cabinet secretary. Uh, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? None. Um, then it remains for me then to put the question on the motion, and the question is that the motion S four M one two six four five be approved. Are we agreed? Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, Thank for you. your time with us this morning. Thanks. And that concludes our business for today. And I know, I know it was, I know it was. Uh...